is uh, aimed at non rheumatologist and we have wonderful topics and great speakers and great teachers and uh, uh, to teach what is rheumatology and nuances of rheumatology to uh, predominantly non rheumatology audience and i and, and the topics have been fantastic very well chosen and i am sure uh, that there more more people would come in uh, the next 15 20 minutes and we'll have a wonderful meeting and uh, my best wishes for the, all the speakers and uh, happy learning thank you very much he works in pune and he's done a lot of work and he's a brilliant speaker so i won't come in the way dr chopra Good morning. Thank you to the organizers of Eurocon for this very wonderful opportunity and to be here this morning. Uh, I think it's very nice that uh, I'm uh, addressing this session in MM Decide Hall. And from a very early day, I remember that one of the most quoted publications in Japan used to be a 25 years based case series by Dr. Emil Hussain. That was the methodology. Then, things have changed, there's almost a revolution. Uh, so, uh, I think the, the key word in my talk is the community. Nothing um, relevant. Maybe I'll encourage some of my young friends here to visit the publications. There are several more on the COCCORD, which is the Community-Oriented Program for Control of Rheumatic Disease, a program at WHO. Uh, this is going to be more or less a, a screen of the kind of subjects that you'll see subsequently. Now, I think, friends, this screen has got frozen. Maybe it's too cold and indoor. Can somebody move this forward now? Okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, you know, I think this may be my personal bias, but I still hold this bias. I think maybe the curriculums have changed, but I don't think we are really taught during our medicine days what the community is all about. And uh, we ought to also think, what is a community? I mean, you can have a hospital-based community that, but I'm sure some of you are working in a community setting like I have worked for the last 30 years or so. Uh, the important thing is that uh, we ought to know where our patients come from. This is very important. This has great bearings on general practice, specialist practice, also on research, also like academia. Very often we publish papers we don't really take enough care to define as to where the patients came from. That's very important. That's a denominator. So uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, we live in this very wonderful country which is uh, marked by diversity and uh, no population study can ever represent it. We can get very close to representing India and I think that's what I'm going to possibly try and uh, uh, talk about. And please remember there are several prejudices and biases on every setting that you work at. Know your plus points and minus points. I think that's important. Uh, community studies are best when they have a very robust sample size, when the selection is unbiased, and you have a protocol to do community-based studies. In my opinion, many of us do community studies without really a protocol. Now, I do not intend covering more than 150 plus rheumatological disorders that there today, and they're increasing by the day. Many more diseases are being recognized. Fascinated to hear about Vexus just last week in the ACR. So, uh, so uh, that's not my intention. And during the uh, course of the day, you will hear uh, uh, several aspects of uh, rheumatology. And neither I'm going to go through a classification. Uh, I think we all should have a working classification of mind when we talk about rheumatic disorders, uh, whether it's a clinical syndrome based or physiological based. So, anyway, I think you're going to get a lot more. But I'm going to talk about 
what we perhaps miss in our practice or what we perhaps don't like to see in practice. Our obsessions are so much on inflammatory arthritis. I wonder how many of us feel comfortable when a patient comes with elbow pain and we, not, we don't know a damn as to what is elbow pain. Well, that is also not us. Or we do not feel comfortable when a patient walks in bilateral knee pain, 65 year old, we think it's away, it's not very exciting. And though it's a hardcore rheumatoid problem, osteoarthritis, we feel pretty good if the person goes to the operative surgeon or goes somewhere else. Because we have this bias that not much can be done in OAD. And that I think we need to get rid of all those myths. So uh, to begin with, this is my own clinic based. A long time back, I looked at my own outpatient to decide as to what kind of patients do I see. In we are a we are uh, we have a big staff, we have got four babies, eight, seven, eight doctors work at one time, three rheumatologists, fellows, large number of paramedics, radiology. We have organized ourselves into what a rheumatology center would require. And uh, we can handle large volumes. And that's what I think is our strength. When you work in a community, you should be able to handle large volumes at the same time to just your patients. You can't do this kind of breakup if you just say, hey, what are you and what's your problem and you go to You have a lot of database to record their uh, problems in great detail. And that's very time consuming. But this is the kind of picture. I'm sure you've seen inflammatory 60 percent. If I was working in a hospital or a large reference center, maybe this would go up to 80 or 90 percent. If I was working in an orthopedic center, many of also working in an orthopedic center, this would drop down to about 45 to 50 percent. But that's not what the community is all about. So let me go back to the community. Friends, I'm not going to burden you what this WHO program is, but this has been my program for the last three, four decades. Many of my friends are here, my, uh, my colleagues are here, my, ment uh, my mentor is here. Uh, a wonderful program which was actually begun in 1980s to target the community. Begin with the community and build up your story. That was the basic pain, disability. Capture the community problems, what the community thinks, how they get treated, things like that. A lot of basic things. And then there's a something like a pyramid. So this was what we started several years back and in 1990 we signed it. This is my very first Cockcourt population survey of about 5,000 people in a rural setting, hardcore setting, and I'm very happy to share with you. We're very excited. This is our 27th year this study is going on. This is the only, this is the only uh, uh, epidemiological study of this kind which has lasted for 27 years in the world. And as I tell you, we'll get some wonderful data because we've just finished a 25-year house to house survey looking at the change in the landscape of rheumatoid disorders just re recently after COVID. So, uh, so there are some insights that I'd like to share with you. And as you can see, all right, you can already see that in this particular study in 1996, the inflammatory part <coughs> patients or respondents in an epidemiological sense who responded to say that, yes, we have had pain, musculoskeletal, present or past, less than 10% have inflammatory outsides. What do we need? We'll talk about it. A large number of community, if I can use the word patients, subjects, whichever way you look at it, depending on what kind of study you do, have things like osteoarthritis, of course, is a, is a huge chunk, especially in a community where the population is aging. But then you've got IDS. In that time, I called it IDS. I could not classify several patients with ill-defined aches and pain. Soft rheumatism, and we'll talk about other things. And after four or five years, Dr. Vidyanti Lagu Joshi, my colleague rheumatologist, and me, then we organized a similar study of about 8,000, I think 800 people in a very well-defined geographical area in Pune, urban. And we could make comparisons. But interestingly, nothing changed much. Have you seen that? In a community setting, whether it's urban, Pune, or nearby village, you find the breakup is almost similar. People are suffering not so much from intimate disorders as much as suffering from all the other things you see. They may not reach you. You may not see them. But that's the true landscape of rheumatological disorders. And I'm glad with this program, there are some very nice talks on software rhythm. I particularly liked whoever said that subject, responsible management of pain in a community city. I'd love to hear that experience. <coughs> so uh, we didn't stop there. Then we went all over India, 17 sites. Uh, of course, this survey sample is now almost a one lakh. You've included a lot of randomized studies we have done. 
But anyway, this is again it's the same thing, except that in 2006, Chikungunya visited India to the large epidemic, and that changed the landscape of musculoskeletal. So we find some people being captured with Chikungunya arthritis. And then perhaps uh, we were more focused, we didn't want just soft rheumatism. So I'm going to talk about backache after being, I think Molly's talking, of course she's there. So you know about back pain, right? There you are. So people wanted back ache to have a separate segment. And you can see there's a large proportion. And again, I put a circle to say that inflammatory arthritis has never exceeded 10% of the community load of MSK pains. And those of you who are in general practice here will bear that out. That how many patients really read those proportions. So uh, my topic is not about the burden of I'm to talk about the spectrum. But it's nice that those of you interested, please visit this. Uh, this, this sums up our effort of about 15, 20 years. There's something more coming here after this also. But we are quite certain, after looking at so many population studies, pulling the data, these are possibly the most robust figures on the prevalence of various muscular disorders. I put talk about big one, which is one side, to show you the contrast. One village cannot represent India. But then we got all the data pulled in. And I would say, please don't ever say in your presentation that we have sparse data. 30 years later, I'm talking on the same thing. So my young people ought to read about Indian data and quote Indian studies. We have lots of data now. The aim of this slide is to impress upon you, don't worry, hack is about a functional assessment of various disease, health assessment question, came from Stanford, modified, all those things are maybe from the, for the lecture. But what our data shows is, we were biased that hack visibility, functional visibility, where do you expect more? We didn't admit your arthritis, so much arthritis, or other intimate disorders. This data told us that it's not only rheumatoid which suffers from, let's say, a severe hack disability. Whether we understand our community problems or not, but patients with soft rheumatism, osteoarthritis, so just symptoms, even they have what I call a major rheumatological problem, functional. And uh, let me talk, okay, so there are several Indian maps showing major disorders and I just picked up soft rheumatism and well, something we neglect actually and I think somebody will talk about it later. Occupational overuse syndrome. I learned all about that working in villages. I'm sure you can make up. You can keep on saying the CMC is OA only. Okay, secondary OA, but I'll give you one particular picture of a lady working. That's how they get this. And especially if ours is a little hypermobile population. So I don't really think of you who use very often joints into giving the joints a phenotype which sometimes looks like OA and sometimes inflammatory. So what are we need to recognize? And then don't forget the computers and the mobiles giving a whole lot of occupational overuse syndromes. Now, uh, it's all right. We need to know about classification criteria. But when we work in the community, the diagnosis predominantly clinical. And I'm sure my general practitioner colleagues and, and we all should remember that. Our diagnosis is very clinical, but I think knowing classroom criteria sort of, you know, gives a sharp edge to how we do. So this picture of rheumatoid arthritis in India is similar to anywhere else in the world. There are a few changes, maybe some other time. So what's important for me to share with you is that all the studies that we have done, they are teaching us the so-called the large number of zero negative RNA. We all know, but very often we all confront a reference which says that factor is negative and therefore this is not what it is. So we have seen over the last couple of decades that seronegative RA can be as deforming, as disabling as a seropositive. But remember the seropositivity I'm showing you. And CCP we did, we had preserved samples from 1996 and we did CCP when it was available and this just validates. So remember the low percentage in a community setting, a good community study, <coughs> epidemiological study, all over the world has never shown a rooted factor positive more than 50%. It's always, it always become a hallmark of community epidemiology. If you get more than that, your study is possibly biased by a lot of hospital inclusions and things like that. It may not be truly uh, community. And uh, remember that when patients walk in with rheumatoid, you know that they are rheumatoid arthritis, they can have other problems as well. For example, this lady, wrist swelling, thought something was unusual, the x-ray was looking quite a disaster. You should see that actually. Turn out closely. So, uh, just a, we see all kinds of osteoarthritis. And possibly, in fact, 
Yeah, but yesterday's one patient which really baffled me was an erosive DIP osteoarthritis which looked so much like rheumatoid. In fact, I'm still not very sure whether it's both or it's only one. So some of these forms can be a great mimic. So remember that, that osteoarthritis can present in all these forms and uh, maybe somebody, and there's a workshop going on, I think, today on osteoarthritis already. In community setting, early cases, I made the person touch the, the sacral region to show that don't miss inflammatory sacralitis in, in a general practice setting. In our early careers, we very often, though we read about it, but somehow we are very callous about differentiating between inflammatory back pain and mechanical back pain. I know sometimes very difficult, but it's important, the other signs. And, so, yeah, and then, of course, this is something very glaring. I think I mean, it doesn't need much an effort to look at uh, ankle spondylitis. But why I'm showing this young man out here is look at the hand deformities. Most of us may not be aware that if you leave un ankylosing spondylitis untreated, or even if you treat sometimes, it's, pr it's ruthlessly progressive. And ankylosing spondylitis can end up in disastrous peripheral joint deformity. In fact, that was my case in DNB vaccine full blown ankylosing spondylitis. In fact, the very first time I saw that, I remember that. So yes, remember some of these situations. Uh, we see fair number of psoriatic arthritis in rheumatology practice, but surprisingly, if you had a quick look at the earlier slide I showed you, when you look at the psoriatic arthritis in a community setting, the prevalence of psoriatic arthritis is rather low. I don't have any reasons for it, maybe some other day, but yes. Uh, thoracic arthritis can mimic in the beginning a root arthritis, but you got to look at the skin, sanctuary site. We often miss the diagnosis behind the scalp line, in the umbilicus, and things like that. Uh, please tell me when 12 minutes over, because we started late and I am trying to uh, save some time. Okay. So, uh, rate of the bugs. Now, I brought one most glaring example of my practice, which was published. You know, a lady of uh, both both these patients whom you see out here, they suffered from rheumatoid for a long, long time. The lady on the, the, the case report on my right side, further right, was an eye opener for me. End up with gross lefnomide induced septicemic toxicity with cytopenia. Recovered in the ICU setting, unsupervised lefnomide for quite some time. And she went into a huge swelling in the right hip region, and maybe, went to, I think maybe about two or three liters of pus was removed repeatedly, and you can see the whole right hip dissolved. We thought of staff, but nothing ever grew because. When you give them so many broad spectrum antibiotics, we don't know. Made a remarkable recovery and went on, went on for THR. Stayed in hospital two and a half months, was determined to walk out. Now, these are the daring situations in rheumatology where you work very closely with orthopedic surgeons, but that is important. The one which is the closer to me baffled me with a shoulder swelling, diagnosed rheumatoid arthritis for quite some time, till there was a little bit of pointing sign, little abscess coming. Never hesitated to. Aspirate, whether it be imaging or not. And this turned out tuberculosis. So these are complex settings. Infections are a very important part of our practice. But I just picked up a slide to emphasize the point for my younger colleagues and innovation. I mean, it's a, even the most astute physicians can get fooled by this situation that every polyarthritis is not one right. This was one of the published cases. There are very few case reports of acute polyarthritis uh, diagnosed as Hansen's leprosy. And leprosy can come in all hues and colors in our in our practice. Please, please, please summarize and show. No, sir. I've been showing nine minutes. You can't make my call. So I'm also timing it. Anyway, I'll go by you, but give me my time and fairness. So, uh, so then this is chikunia arthritis, and I think the point I wish to take tell you is that chikunia. Well, let me put one word only. Chikunia can present with all forms of inflammatory arthritis, non-inflammatory, and I think it's really a puzzle. But uh, there are a lot of publications out there. Please have a look at it. Gout. Yes. Mostly a male disease. Once in a while, women. But I still believe very strongly that before menopause, women rarely get gout. Remember that. But then this polyarticular and young people and genetics. Now, I'm not going to talk about these situations because just to compete, in a community setting, we don't see so much of, of lupus or MCTD or Myositis, but we do see them. It's not that they're not there, but in a large population size to capture this. This was another one of my most difficult cases in my early part of rheumatology practice. Reminded me, reminded me of anatomy, isn't it? It looks like a cadaver. I think was went through brought such a big file. Going to the file, three times he had a atrial fibrillation. Hyperthyroidism. 
So remember, there's so many mimics in rheumatoid practice. Not that we only look at rheumatology. In a practice setting, you know, the largest Indian series published on juvenile uh, arthritis, and one of you can visit this paper till today. And it tells about all the problems in a community setting. Uh, to diagnose and establish rheumatoid arthritis is not a big deal. What's important today in practice is to catch them early, early inflammatory arthritis. Watch out. You know, that's where the window opportunity is best. Uh, don't neglect arthritis. Sometimes you see this terrible situation when you walk through gullies and roads and with the community you do this thing and you find elderly people like that lady left outside the home to look after herself. Very advanced rheumatoid arthritis. I've saved time. Thank you very much. Yes. Don't worry about asking anything else. Is it or is it not inflammatory in nature? And at the end of my talk, I will consider that I was successful in communicating this, if you can answer that. Differentiating from non-inflammatory versus inflammatory is at the core of treating rheumatological conditions satisfactory. Joint pains, as far as I am concerned, there are only two major causes. Inflammatory and non-inflammatory. What is this inflammatory, inflammatory? Arvin has been talking about, Molly has been talking. What is this inflammatory business? We rheumatologists are primarily immunologists. So, when we talk of inflammatory, the first thing which comes in mind is immunoinflammatory. So, the <coughs> commonest condition of inflammation for a rheumatologist is not is not infection. And if you ever consider infection as a possibility in the joint, you will have to answer me. What's the cause? Why joint is getting infected? Joints don't get infected. Nature has been very kind to joints. Unless you do something or something happens systematically, only then the joints get infected. So, the cause of inflammation in the joint, number one, immunoinflammation. Number two, crystals, crystals, crystals. And only rarely, and only if you can answer why, then infection. The rest of it, musculoskeletal, green flag, non-inflammatory. And non-inflammatory, Arvind showed, is the majority. And yet, if we rheumatologists, not you. You have to look after non-inflammatory. But we rheumatologists would like to spend our time in doing things which we know more than in doing things which we don't know. Non-inflammatory physiotherapists, occupational therapists, uh, orthopedic surgeons, they can all handle. Rheumatologists will like to spend their time where we can do wonders. We can prevent deformities. And that's why I am pressing upon differentiation between inflammation and non-inflammation. Structural mechanical damage, that's what the mechanical thing is. There is a third thing and I'm going to give a talk. Nowadays, we knew about nociceptive pain and we have been talking, Molly went in great detail in the second pain, the neuralgic pain. <laughs> But if you remove neur neuralgic pain and nociceptive pain, the common pain, you get hit or you get pricked or you get injured, that's nociceptive, uh, nociceptive pain, the commonest one. But when you remove all this, there's a large number of patients, especially in musculoskeletal, no cause of pain and they have pain, pain. They are patients with pain and back pain is one of them. So that's third pain. And we call them fibromyalgia and many other mm, chronic pelvic pain, chronic back pain, etc. But I'm giving a separate talk for third pain. So we will not waste time on that anymore. But this kind of 
widely distribution pain in the body. That's a disease by itself. And patient wants the name. So I'll tell you, when I, my next talk is there, I'll tell you what name we give to that. Now, how do we say, by sitting in front of the patient, and general physician, he doesn't know about all the details and which ligament and what, and which T cell or B cell or which arrow is going which way and which cytokine. The simple thing is, patient is there, is it inflammatory or not? What questions should I try to listen? Or what questions should I put? And what answer am I expecting? How do you feel when you get up in the morning? That's the golden question. Remember, will you please remember? How do you feel when you get up in the morning? Single question will answer most of the nuances of inflammatory back pain or inflammatory joint pain or inflammatory musculoskeletal pain. How do you feel when you get up in the morning? There are this kind of answer. I feel very stiff. When I get up in the morning, I feel very stiff. Oh, the second possible answer. Oh, you know, oh my God. When I get up in the morning, I have pain. All over pain. Too much pain. I'm very tired. Which one is important? One or two? I will answer. So, what happens? When you start gently moving, going to toilet, going to washroom, changing clothes, taking shower, getting ready, making breakfast, gentle movements, what happens? When you got up in the morning, there was something. Two questions, two answers. I was very stiff. And the second was, oh, I have pain, pain, very tired. So two questions, answers we have. What happens if you gently start moving? Three answers, and which one is correct, you will have to answer. Does this stiffness increase? There will be some answer. I feel very stiff. Sorry. Does stiffness increase when you start working? Does in stiffness decrease with gentle movements? It doesn't make any difference. I get up in the morning very stiff. How do you feel after gentle movement? Oh, it becomes better, surprising. No doctor, what are you asking? I'm having pain. If I start working, my pain increases. What kind of doctor? He doesn't know. Eh? I have pain, so I work, my pain increases. That's where the patient is. <coughs> it makes no difference. So, what's the correct answer for inflammation? One, two, or three? Two, 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 two. Correct. So you got it. This is inflammatory in nature. There are some other questions which can help you. There is just too much pain. I'm very tired. You know, it gets worse. The moment I start doing something, I want to lie down. <laughs> That's exactly the opposite of a disease, an inflammatory disease. Pain and stiffness improves on taking rest, my God. You will get fat, you will get metabolic syndrome, you will get heart attack, you don't have any musculoskeletal disease, my dear. You can go home, relax, but the patient needs it. And they will go to a particular type of doctor, my next talk on pain. Another thing, oh doctor, you know, my joints become red. Fortunately, our brown skin never becomes red. Whatever is the severity of inflammation. So if you get the answer, my joints become red, I'm very tired. You can be rest assured, it's not inflammatory in nature. It is structural, mechanical, or the third pain which I'm going to talk about. How do you feel when you start doing daily household? I feel better, but by afternoon and evening I start feeling exhausted, favors inflammatory. I'm so fatigued and tired, goes in favor of either the third pain or mechanical structure. Now, this, you know doctor, I have so much pain in my shoulder, it just goes down the 
whole hour. I have pain in my buttocks. It just goes down. Anything which goes vertically cannot be a joint disease. The joint disease is on the other side, like this, horizontal. Here is the pain, here is the pain, here is the pain. So if the pain is running on the arms and legs, it is nothing to do with joint disease, which is inflammatory, not even joint disease. It's a neurological. It's Neurotic, uh, neurologic pain. So longitudinal running pains against inflammation, against muscular skeleton. Pain across the joint, that's the inflammatory, most of the, or mechanical structure. So key points in clinical history. Lock, the third, the, the another extra point besides morning stiffness. Loss of pain, loss of appetite, tiredness, low grade fever, weight loss, feverish feeling. And on the other hand, last question. When I eat dahi khate hai, karela khate hai, bangan khate hai, pain bada jata hai, thank you, you can go home, you have no disease at all. <laughs> Against the diagnosis of infertility. Uh, I will not take your time, um, but a pain, low back pain, spondyloarthritis, Molly has gone in detail. But just one point. How is your back pain? I know she gave detailed in, um, data available that if the morning stiffness is not there and inflammatory back pain by history, even then the patient may not have inflammatory back disease but something else. But still I will like at a primary level do ask how do you feel when you get up in the morning? Oh, I'm totally stiff with the back. What happens if you take a shower, dress yourself, move around a little bit? Well, the pain improves. That is inflammatory in nature, unless until excluded, and there's some other diseases are seen. One thing I would like to tell, because orthopedic surgeons, my very respected colleagues, keep on diagnosing tuberculosis in every, every, every little single joint is swollen, that's tuberculosis. And therefore, I have made a special slide with special color. It's a chronic monoarthritis, dramatic wasting of muscles, especially proximal muscles uh, of the affected joint, usually a monoarthritis, that is tuberculosis. And a small swollen joint in an 11 year old left knee is swollen. Ask for? Never ask for any, please, any tells nothing. I will be telling you about ANA whenever you want. This young boy, 11 years, comes with left knee swelling and it is going on for about five weeks. Somebody said this TB. What will be? No, sir, this is what Molly was teaching. This is spondyloarthritis. It starts with monoarthritis. It is inflammatory in nature. Remember, in pediatric age group, monoarthritis, which is becoming chronic, a single joint is not TB. Healthy person. And when you take the history, yeah, my uncle has a back which is bent like that. Thank you. <laughs> Stiffness improves, dramatic response to NSAIDs. These are some of the classical features of spondyloarthritis, which Molly had already mentioned. I will not go in detail on how to diagnose connective tissue diseases, but I'll just tell you. If along with the inflammatory joint pain, which is stiff in the morning and improves with movement, there are extra articular features or in the skin, in the eyes, in the lungs, in the kidney, in the um, in any other organ of the body and there is fever and uh, 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 systemic manifestation, connective tissue disease and never order ANA for that, please. Okay, so my allotted time doesn't permit to go in detail but there are some things, photosensitive rash and Raynaud's phenomena etc. I will not take time in that. Um, I will just, okay, I know um, my very dear colleague and friend, um, Dr. Yojana Gokhle is the next speaker. She will be talking about a lot about what should be done at the primary care level if the patient comes with musculoskeletal pain, what basic investigations, and what I will do is what not to do. And you know what not to do already. One thing you don't have to do is ANA because it is positive in how many percent of normal people? 
30 percent. So, don't do it. Physical examination, I won't worry. Because that takes six weeks of intense training to learn about a soul and joint. So, don't worry about that. True positive and false positive becomes a very major issue. Patients come to me, I have been diagnosed arthritis because there is swelling. I find no swelling. So, it, it sit its side. Come to us for six weeks, we will teach you how to examine musculoskeletal system. But just don't worry about look, feel, and etc. These are the details. Eliciting pain is very tricky, so I will just pass over. This is disastrous. A real disaster. Panel. I will order laboratory arthritis panel, arthritis screening panel, immunology panel, autoimmune panel. That's money making business. It is unethical. Never order it, please. It misguides the patients more. Doctors are making money, unfortunately, on this, and laboratories are being unethical <coughs> and ordering these tests and giving the wrong reports on this. Don't order. This is a disaster. <laughs> Biggest disaster should not be carried out. It creates more confusion, except when you do pointed tests. That is called choosing wisely of the American College of Rheumatology. So, ANA test is positive up to 40% actually. Rheumatoid factor, there is nothing like RA factor. Never use this term RA factor. It is rheumatoid factor. A has been added by unscrupulous persons who want to make it arthritis factor because rheumatoid factor is present in normal people. And as Armin already mentioned, rheumatoid factor is not positive in many of the rheumatoid arthritis patients. So never worry about. In the community, I have red underlined it, I red highlighted it. In the community, rheumatoid factor has no meaning for a general physician ordering rheumatoid factor is a waste of time. Only these, and I bypass this because Yojana will be talking about it. X-ray, absolute rubbish, 30% damage in the, in the joint and bone is necessary to produce X-ray change. Don't waste patients' money on that. Never get it done at all. And especially now. Why X-ray? We are going for MRI. My God, do you know how they interpret MRI? They are still not sure what to call sacroiliitis till today. <laughs> and now the new kids on the block. Wonderful. We will make more money on that. Get done B27. Do you know? We in All India Institute in 1970s, 6% of the Indian population, which is totally normal, is actually B27 positive. So why get B27 done? You are wasting time. You are misguiding the patient. And here comes the real, real stuff. Uric, mera to uric acid aagya. Are help me that yaar, come on. Uric acid is a poor watchman of the, of the society. Tells please stop eating so much. Do some exercise. Don't take too much alcohol. You will, <laughs> thank you, I'm almost finished. <laughs> Uh, just one slide. Uh, this is a good one. That's all. Okay. okay. Pain amplification. I'm going to talk uh, talk about it. So I will just bypass. This is the weightage. Answer to this first. Eighty percent by history, which I have been discussing. Fifteen percent on examination, and don't do tests because they are hardly at five percent. But at the specialist level, it becomes very different. At when we meet ourselves, we talk different language, but I'm entirely talking for that category who is practicing general medicine and seeing community musculoskeletal diseases, which Arvind was talking about. And I think, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks to 
uh, have used different color for relevant because I think that's the most important uh, word in this study. Now before we actually start, uh, I just want to tell you that it is always good to include as basic investigation or as a part of bedside, CBC is a um, so history taking, examination and CBC is a reason should be included in the package of you know, general examination thing. So look for any cytopenia, leukocytosis, thrombocytosis, anemia, chronic inflammation, uh, any ASR raised or not raised helps in you know finding, finding out uh, that it is inflammatory versus non-inflammatory, especially patients who have lots of aches and pains. If it is you know, raised ESR, then definitely there is something wrong, some inflammation is going on in the body. But repeatedly normal ESR in such a patient helps you to find out, okay, is it a chronic pain syndrome of fibromyalgia versus you know, something really important. And very high ESR, more than 100, suggests some kind of chronic inflammation like extra pulmonary TB. Of course, TB pulmonary also would produce, but an extra pulmonary can be missed. Um, malignancy somewhere or aromatic disease. So very high ESR, think of these three causes. And urine again extremely important in every patient of aches and pains because uh, whether systemic involvement, kidney involvement is there or not, uh, tells you that you know, it's other than musculoskeletal system, one more system is involved. So patient will not complain of you know, any kidney involvement as such. So if there is a proteinuria, red blood cells in the urine, and then, because quite often I have seen in a busy practice people, for young patients do not take blood pressure. So young patient with high blood pressure and then proteins or RBCs in the urine would tell that the kidney is uh, involved. I mean, when we are taught systems in a medical college, I am a professor in a medical college, so uh, CVS, respiratory, abdominal and CNS is taught, we are not taught kidney as a system. So when I ask uh, students, even in uh, third MB based uh, students, if you ask, okay, if kidney is affected, uh, what will you get clinically or which biochemical parameter is wrong, third MB based students have not entered into practice. They, they think of it as a manual and clearance and this and that, but half of them really cannot answer that the creatinine is released or the would be abnormal. Okay, so now the most important word that relevant See, rheumatology is actually truly a clinical branch and still there are lots and lots of investigations in rheumatology and that is why we have to actually choose very wisely what to uh, order in a given uh, condition and that is why rheumatological conditions are you know, divided into these uh, clinical syndromes. So on history and examination to try and find out whether the patient has a disease, is it articular or whether it is systemic syndrome with the patient has generalized aches and pains everywhere, muscle symptoms, back symptoms, inflammatory or non-inflammatory. That is the first step and then you decide which investigations to order. Now I think my, my previous speakers have spoken a lot about inflammatory, non-inflammatory, articular, non-articular. So I am not going to spend time on that. I will go to in each of these categories which investigations to order and how to interpret. Okay, so acute monoarthritis, that is less than 6 weeks duration monoarthritis, most commonly the patient will be having reactive arthritis or gout or OA flare or very very rarely septic arthritis and here the most important investigation is synovial fluid examination. Look for the cell count, look for crystals, if it is gout related you will find a needle shaped crystals, ask for gram stain and for thinking of infection which is actually really rare. Uh, ask for uh, culture. Now this is how um, non-inflammatory fluid looks like. You can actually see the um, the markings on the uh, syringe through it. Whereas inflammatory fluid looks turbid like this. And then the cell count for non-inflammatory is less than 2000 for inflammatory more than 2000 and for infective. Um, uh, nearly a lakh and about 90% uh, of them would be polymorphonuclear and see in the last 35 years of rheumatology practice in uh, a medical college as well as private 
I must have seen at least a lack of her uh, rheumatological conditions and uh, just one or two septic arthritis. So it's that rare even when you are, you know, doing uh, a lot of rheumatology, you know, time spent in rheumatology is not really rare. And that would be again some underlying arthritis which got also, you know, some uncontrolled diabetes and things like that. Uh, practically every joint can be aspirated and in uh, uh, arthritis, uh, in uh, other than septic arthritis, remaining all you can inject uh, local tripod for immediate symptomatic relief. So now this is a list of investigations for uh, polyarthritis, now out of which again CBC, ESR, CRP are important. Here uh, I want to spend some time on leukocytosis is seen in rheumatoid arthritis. And because of steroids also, quite often patients may be taking steroids as alternative therapy, homeopathic, Ayurvedic, or maybe for a you knowledge general practitioner has to give something for immediate symptomatic relief. So patient uh, patient has been given, and that can cause uh, a rise in WBC count. Infections obviously is a known thing, but whenever there is a cytopenia, think of uh, lupus. I'll. Uh, <coughs> Uh, urinary tract, uh, uh, sorry, uh, urine analysis, as I said, uh, the active uh, are red blood cells or proteins. One should think of SLE and vasculitis. The annual fluid examination I already talked about. ASO, I'll be actually talking about pediatric arthritis. For acute uh, symptoms, uh, chikungunya, generally, patient would have fever, some kind of a rash, and multiple members in the community or a geographic area or family would be affected. Uh, rheumatoid factor biochemistry will be coming. X-ray chest uh, would be abnormal in Ponsex, which is you know uh, tuberculosis related arthritis, in sarcoidosis and vaginos. So in CBCSR urine, other than whatever I already said, what more should you look for? Anemia of chronic disease is seen in patients of RA, rheumatoid arthritis. So generally 8.5 to 9.5 is their uh, hemoglobin and their MCV would be normal. So it is normocytic, normochromic anemia. Uh, as you treat uh, these patients and the disease uh, comes under control, uh, their anemia improves. So the laboratory tests are one for diagnosis, secondary while monitoring also, and uh, monitoring for uh, the disease activity improvement, uh, as well as for uh, looking for complications which may be uh, medication related or disease related. In, uh, whenever you are clinically suspecting lupus because in addition to joint pain patient has a, a fever, rashes, mouth ulcers, Raynaud's phenomenon, significant weight loss and all and in such a patient if there is low hemoglobin ask for uh, a direct Coombs test which would be positive and like autoimmune hemorrhagic anemia is one of the uh, features of, of uh, lupus. Uh, leukocytosis, as I said, occurs in RA and vasculitis, whereas leukopenia and uh, lupus. Thrombocytosis occurs in RA. Again, this also improves very well with uh, DMARDS and good, good disease control. Whereas thrombocytopenia in a joint, in a person who has joint pains, please ask for AN in such a patient. So, in a person who has got joint pain, if there is leukopenia or thrombocytopenia, ask for any. It is uh, ESR would occur in any inflammatory disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, vasculitis, mixed connective tissue disease, polymyalgia, rheumatica, giant cell arthritis, myositis. But it is normal in patients of fibromyalgia, hypothyroidism, osteomalacia and scleroderma which is a connective tissue disease where it, an uh, uh, ESR is normal. Now remember here that all joint pain patients ask for urine. Kidneys are never involved in rheumatoid arthritis. So urine examination would be normal in a person of rheumatoid arthritis. In something that looks like rheumatoid arthritis to you and urine is showing protein 1 plus or there are 8 to 10 RBCs, ask for ANA. Of course, urological causes of you know RBCs in the urine, like you know having a stone or something, would be ruled out by, um, as well as 
female person who is not menstruating during that time has been ruled. <coughs> so, uh, proteinuria and red blood cells in the urine uh, would give you an indication as okay, this is not just pertaining to the joints, uh, it, there is possibly systemic involvement and I should look for lupus and vascular. So, one important message for all musculoskeletal symptoms, please ask for urine examination as always. Okay, rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP lots has been said about it, about positive in around 60-70% patients of rheumatoid arthritis. It is less specific and can be positive in many other conditions like lupus, Sjogren's, mastitis, leprosy as well. And leprosy also produces erosions also. So, arthritis of lepra reaction can really, uh, uh, once in a while, uh, really uh, be mistaken for rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, anti-CCP again is present in around 60-70% patients, but it is more specific for rheumatoid arthritis. The percentage of false positive like or being positive in other uh, conditions is much less than uh, rheumatoid factor test or RA test. I was just wondering when Dr. Malviya said this, why people call it. So, A is important, Anand Malviya A is really important for Indian rheumatology, that is A Raghdiya. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then uh, anti-nuclear antibodies by immunofluorescence and uh, it is a screening test for connective tissue diseases. Uh, whenever a patient of joint pain has other features addition, in addition to joint pain like <coughs> uh, episodic fever, mouth ulcers, weight loss, Raynaud's phenomenon that is you know blue and blanching and red fingers. Uh, two of the three colors. Uh, then cytopenias or abnormal urine reports ask for LA. It is positive in other conditions <laughs> like in addition to SLE, scleroderma, Sjogren's, myositis, mixed connective tissue diseases, certain organ specific autoimmune diseases like uh, autoimmune hepatitis, autoimmune thyroiditis, primary biliary cirrhosis. It is positive in infections like infectious hepatitis, EB virus infection and some hematologic malignancies as well as solid tumors. So ANA positivity uh, unless you know the features of lupus are there doesn't make a diagnosis of uh, lupus and then actually uh, the significant titers now laboratories have been changing the titers a lot initially it used to be you know, 1 is to 40 and then it used to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus so 1 plus was as good as negative and 2 plus was positive but anyway titers of nowadays most laboratories start the basic titer as 1 is to 100 and then give it as multiples of that, you know, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus. Anyway, when, uh, whenever there is a problem, you can ask for uh, actual titers and NA titers 1 is to 160 is uh, a significant titer. And then uh, in, a, in a suspected case of lupus, ask for a more specific test that is anti DSDNA and anti Smith. So, indications for ANA is suspected uh, CTD, isolated Raynaud's phenomenon and patient of nephrotic syndrome and nephritis and uh, childhood arthritis I talk about this week. Okay. Other investigations for connective tissue diseases will be based on the clinical suspicion. So if you are suspecting myositis then you will ask for muscle enzymes like CPK idolase. There are a few uh, types of uh, myositis patient where CPK is normal and idolase is raised. Then ask for electrophysiologic studies like EMG. Muscle MRI can show abnormal uptake in the inflamed muscles and basically helps to choose the <coughs> muscle to be biopsied. If you know, a particular muscle is showing um, and then your uh, MRI person, the radiologist should know what protocol to follow uh, for when you ask for muscle MRI because if he doesn't know then they have to really talk to some centers which actually ask for, you know, run a protocol for muscle MRI because every MRI site that they screen if they start charging uh, 8000 that would be unaffordable for patients. So if your radiologist from your center is not doing it, they can talk to the center which are actually doing it. Okay, just two minutes. Uh, yeah. uh, then for Sjogren's anti rho anti la lip salivary gland biopsy and then rule out the simulators. Uh, vasculitis, ANCAP, uh, 
for small vessel anka positive vasculitis and uh, by immunofluorescence and anti fear cure anti mpu by laser uh, biopsy of the affected uh, organ uh, like from this for the skin if it is ulcer from the ulcer edge if it's a nodule then a surgical biopsy of the nodule etc then one can also do biopsy of kidney muscle for medium and large vessel vasculitis angiography which could be conventional dsa CT angiography, MR angiography, and then for etiology part of it, whether it is Hep B, Hep C related. Uh, 2D echo quite often to rule out a mimicker. Uh, infective endocarditis, you know, like can throw Ebola here, there, and can mimic uh, vasculitis as well as antiphospholipid antibodies. Uh, investigation for gout, documentation of uh, monosodium urate crystals in the sinoid fluid is the test. When, if it is not possible, then there are other tests like you know, dual energy CT of the affected joint. The, it shows urate crystals as green. Then double contour sign where you know the uh, crystals which are deposited into the cartilage is seen as a, another uh, parallel line as shown in that picture. As, and the X-rays actually show like you know gouty tophi are like a parrot beak uh, tophi with you know overhanging edge. Uh, uric acid have, can occur in multiple things in the patients who are on drugs like aspirin. Now, any diuretic uh, would have a high uric acid. Uh, look for comorbidities uh, like metabolic syndrome. And okay, IBD related, I think this has been covered, so I can skip it. In which uh, investigation for diffuse aches and pains, ESR CRP will be normal in non inflammatory cases, TSH for hypothyroid patients, and then uh, run a uh, calcium profile to check if it is related to that. Sometimes the scintigraphy really helps uh, because it may show abnormal uptake in the joints which you know otherwise when you are examining uh, may not be, like you may not actually have so much time in, a, in general practice to devote to joint examination. The child specifically, uh, yeah, uh, arthritis related to rheumatic fever and um, in a childhood spondyl orthopathy starts in just one or two joints in the lower limbs, so asking for uh, HLB27 in them is important. And ANA in childhood arthritis because they can have a uveitis and a child may not really complain of vision loss, especially when you know one <coughs> uh, eye is only affected and uh, permanent vision loss can occur because of uh, chronic uveitis related to J. Thank you so much. Just oh, one more question. Yes. I mean, if we aspirate a sinoid fluid from an elderly lady with the OA, uh, it's very nasty effusion. If we incidentally find some gout or pseudo gout crystals, do we treat it as gout or? CPD crystals you may find quite often. Yes. Then acid crystals you should not find. CPPD crystals are one of the most difficult things to see. You have to have polarized light microscopy and you will have to put them under oil immersion only then they are visible, they are very small. So CPPD will not be uh, reported on a routine laboratory, so you can forget about that. But if the MSU crystals are seen, either you have missed the history or something has happened and the patient has had gout and in the critical gout can show crystals, so there cannot be any difficulty about that. But then you take the history, there will be history of acute gouty attack in the past. So that's the way to interpret um, the negatively birefringent crystals of MS. Okay, oil immersion. All, yeah, yeah, because yeah, we yeah. all do it ourselves, so it's under oil immersion, very difficult to diagnose. Ma'am, how many percentage of patients who are rheumatoid factor negative? Suffering from rheumatoid zero negative will be showing positivity to NTCC. So, around 40 percent, 40 percent, around 30 percent, like RF negative, RA negative, and NTCC. Yeah. So, uh, that's why your uh, verbal eloquence. But when you talk to the patients, they come. They say, "Sir, I have taken the heat. I have taken large yes. and 
they has got worsening of the symptoms sure. and the message sent across the audiences that you sent home we need to take them seriously exactly. because when we read i read the can, can i can i just uh, no, uh, i, I will just finish it off and that and when you read Ayurvedic tests, there are some Patya and Patya foods which can worsen or which can ameliorate the symptoms. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Now let me answer it scientifically. At All India Institute, there was a PhD under me. Uh, Deepa Berry was the name. Whenever patients said that I have problem with this food, we said, good that you told us. We will buy empty capsules from Bhavirat Palace in Delhi where all the capsules are available. Fill up with the same stuff. Tell this drug has come from America. This is the latest treatment for this kind of pain. You take it and you will be alright. Tell me what happens next week. She comes back, sir, magical. All my pains have disappeared. Then I will open and show them and they will fight. Why did you give it? But don't you think that is a placebo effect? Exactly. That so, is what I am saying. So That there is no scientific fact in Chinese. People are slightly ahead of us, unfortunately. They have tried all kind of this, what they call Chinese medicine, which is almost equivalent. They have not been able to prove that any one of them under uh, controlled trial crossover study have shown any efficacy. Moreover, the, um, I will not name, but in South India, everyone knows that center. We and Chandrasekharan and Devdhar, late Devdhar, we were together in 1985 till 89. <coughs> we used to go there, give them the patient diagnosed by us, they will treat, and then they will say the patient is better or not better. Three, the, three of the patients took them to court, none of them improved, most of them became deformed. This study was never published. Ramlinga Swami's late Ramlinga Swami. He told us, Anand, it is in our heart. Don't utter a word against our way. You will be the most person. So, what is the bottom line? Uh, we as scientists will like proof. That's the bottom line. Sir, today my question is in case of Ophthalmology, we will refer any scleritis and uveitis without any giant symptoms, RA positive, RA and CC positive. RA, what is RA? RF positive. RF, sorry. <laughs> RF positive or anti-CC positive. I am a teacher here. Rheumatoid factor positive and they are having scleritis or uveitis. They are referred to a physician, what to do? A patient with rheumatoid diagnosed having iritis, then it's not a common thing in rheumatoid. It is most episcleritis and scleritis which occurs in rheumatoid. So either the, uh, the ophthalmologist is giving a wrong diagnosis or the clinician has made a wrong diagnosis of rheumatoid and the patient has gone to the want to know what to do yes, in such a thing is whether to treat it patient doesn't have any suppose, suppose a scleritis has been referred to you yeah. whether the patient has any underlying joint pains or no joint pains no joint pain yeah fine then look for any evidence of say vaginus if it is there or not and even if it is not there ask for the only test if i have to tell you to do for a scleritis patient is ask for anta to see that is the first presentation, scleritis as a first presentation of Anka positive vasculitis, a vaginus. So that can happen because you know, RA or anti-CCP, if it is positive, that doesn't make that scleritis a patient a rheumatoid arthritis patient. That scleritis may be related to his rheumatoid arthritis, may you know, like develop clinically a few years later. The scleritis part, you have to give immunosuppression, steroids as well as immunosuppression, but Vaginus related scleritis is important to diagnose timely because vaginus as a disease also if not treated within a year's time almost 80-85% of them would die as well as the local complications of vaginus scleritis, a perforation etc. are much higher than any other scleritis. So sir, this one test by now, so on. Us test ke baare mein just, uh, uh, she is right, Anka is an important test if you have eye involvement. But uh, knowing the laboratories, and because first anchor ever in India was done on my blood, 
I submitted as a volunteer in my lab in Pakistan. We know till today, very few laboratories are giving you accurate anchor tests. So if you just keep on ordering in places where it is not recommended, or you are just trying to fish around what's happening, fishing they call it, then you may get a lot of positive anchor which are not dangerous. But if you are sure in the eye, yeah, it could be. Bombay, we send it to only two labs. Yeah, that's reliable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely reliable lab you need for. Uh, so my question is to sir, uh, sometimes we get patients with the mechanical low back pain or low back pain due to degenerative arthritis. And they also complain of morning sickness, but not classical 30 minutes. And uh, on the other side, uh, some patients of uh, inflammatory arthritis, they also they all complain of low back pain and also morning sickness, but duration is less than 30 minutes. So in this case, how we should proceed? Actually, uh, Molly had gone in great detail. All the details were there and I was watching some beautiful slides of comparison between the two types that you were asking. But I can just give you a summary. Actually, spondyloarthritis is not just only morning stiffness. The additional points keep on adding what we call SPA manifestations and there are eight of them. Each manifestation adds to the likelihood ratio which keeps on increasing. That's the scientific answer. Uh, this is the way we diagnose. Non-specific back pain, very quickly you come to know. It was just by a few extra histories related to these SPA features, they will all be negative. This is how we will distinguish. Therefore, my message will be, if you have a back pain where you at the level of a general physician are having problems, you are most welcome. We will like to assess and then revert back to you, whether it was this or that. Thank you. So we'll close the session for one of time. So I thank the speakers and the audience for the back pain. Can I just answer yes, one yes. question? Yes. We asked about UATs as well. You, yeah, you get UATs referred for finding out medical cause or UATs with some joint pain? Or just UATs find out a medical cause? UATs find out the... Find out medical cause. The list is quite big actually. So you, I mean, and quite often my mistake in our country, UATs get labeled as tuberculous. Infective UATs is extremely rare. Once infective UATs is ruled out, Okay, which is you know like less than one percent would be infective uveitis. Uh, the rest all the treatment would be immunosuppression, especially for intermediate and posterior uveitis. So list of investigations you will find in any book. Recurrent uveitis, recurrent, recurrent uveitis. A A U, recurrent A A U that is anterior uveitis generally affecting one eye at a time, either right, maybe next time it will be left. Most common cause for that would be HLA B27 positivity. Most often these are not vision threatening uveitis. Uh, symptomatic treatment and if it is occurring too often, then actually I put them on a dose of methotrexate uh, as a preventive thing, a weekly methotrexate. Definitely that helps in preventing uh, subsequent attacks. Not responded with methotrexate, Recur requiring recurrence to... Uh, HLA B27 positive, negative. We have not done that. Recurrent deviatis episode. Do HLA uh, dependency. Just uh, ensure that the patient is taking the medicines. Because once patient is fine, patient stops taking medicine. So that is uh, compliance is always an issue. Maybe a small dose of steroid, say 2.5 milligrams of prednisolone as maintenance and 15 milligrams of methotrexate along with folic acid uh, should really prevent uh, the episodes from occurring. How many days we have to give methotrexate? Indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is lifelong. We'll be using little decent word. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, ophthalmologists for helping us with the spondyloarthritis. I think correct diagnosis of spondyloarthritis is being, being made widely by ophthalmologists. They are uh, reference us cases and thank to them. They immediately say that. HLA-B27 positive recurrent UVI, just kindly look into it and we are getting most of our cases referred from them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. They uh, are uh, absolutely well defined, maybe uh, widespread or multi-site pain and it may arise from uh, any uh, possible 
uh, organs or any possible systemic uh, diseases. There are many systemic diseases which are associated with this chronic brain uh, aches and pains and uh, of which uh, most important ones are uh, uh, immune system like autoimmune inflammatory diseases like polymyelia, rheumatica or spondyloarthritis, etc. And they may also arise from several endocrine disorders like hypo or hyperparathyroidism as well as hyperparathyroidism and uh, there may be other viral diseases uh, like uh, chronic viral illness like hepatitis C, uh, HIV, etc. There may be several other causes of these chronic vague aches and pains like uh, dif different sort of uh, neurotic pains arising from multiple sites or uh, they may be of, uh, they may arise uh, from um, uh, overuses of some drugs like statins or aromatase inhibitors. So we cannot solve everything. So we need to focus on uh, something which causes a mixed type of pain, neither neuropathic nor nociceptive. And that was uh, classically described by Professor Malabia is the third type of pain, which is fibromyalgia. So uh, in this forum, uh, uh, talking uh, to the remote general physicians uh, and uh, the PGTs, I would like to focus on fibromyalgia, which characteristically may present systematically with vague, say, aches and pains, and it is uh, affects about two to four percent of the world population with the female preponderance. Now the classical description of fibromyalgia is this: chronic, widespread musculoskeletal pain and tenderness and also associated with uh, neuropsychological symptoms of fatigue, unrefreshing sleep, cognitive dysfunction, anxiety, or depression. Now, there are several pain syndromes uh, which are uh, associated with fibromyalgia with a very high prevalence, and those are called the chronic overlapping pain syndromes. I will show you in my next slide. But what is most important is inability to carry out the normal daily activities with associated substantial consequences, uh, negative consequences for physical and social function. So these are the uh, very common pain syndromes uh, which are associated with high prevalence uh, with fibromyalgia and they, uh, they may be migraine type of headache or memory cognitive difficulties to irritable bowel syndrome or restless leg syndrome and so on and so forth. So they make a chronic overlapping pain syndrome complex. Now, according to ACI uh, guideline, there are two variabilities which has been expressed to, to uh, describe fibromyalgia. One is the history of chronic widespread pain more than uh, three months and the most of the days, and uh, they must exhibit more than 11 out of 18 tender points. But uh, as these are quite variable, the criteria are both 88.4% sensitive and 81% specific. These multi-site pains uh, are, are uh, uh, above and below waist uh, are uh, so variable that the uh, uh, that uh, the newer criteria was established in 2016. They they have revised the previous 2010 ACR guideline to describe this uh, white chronic widespread vague extent pain or fibromyalgia, and uh, they have uh, emphasized on generalized pain defined as pain in at least four out of five regions. And uh, they have kept the uh, duration of the pain as uh, having um, uh, more than three months. But this revised criteria was based on some scores. Those are widespread pain indexes and symptom severity scale score. So depending on these scores, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia was uh, done. But this uh, does not exclude the presence of other clinically important diseases, as I have already mentioned. Now, uh, this is, uh, in nutshell, the uh, pathophysiology. The, there is a central sensitization because of the uh, increase or amplification of the neurotransmitters and uh, some biochemical substances like a glutamate or substance P in the central nervous system, causing a stimulation of this uh, nociceptive system. And there are also peripheral pain generators uh, or nociceptors which get this central sensitization and uh, then thereby they both of them play together to produce this fibromyalgia. There are also other uh, dysfunctions of the neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, uh, dopamine which causes uh, the trigger. Now there are also some uh, conditions uh, which uh, triggers the peripheral pain generators. 
they may be inflammatory uh, musculoskeletal uh, uh, conditions like uh, uh, arthritis, bursitis, or tendinitis, or they may be uh, non-inflammatory or uh, uh, degenerative conditions like joint hypermobility or scoliosis, which acts as a trigger to the peripheral pain generators, causing more widespread pain attributed to the central nervous system factors. Now. Uh, this, uh, about this responsible uh, management of this chronic weight, aches and pains, uh, we need to first identify this fibromyalgia-like symptoms, which persist for more than three months, and then evaluate for other disorders uh, uh, and comorbidities, which I have already mentioned. So if everything comes uh, to normal, then we level the patient having a disease called fibromyalgia. Now these are the recommended uh, uh, workups or laboratory workups which we uh, go to for uh, to exclude uh, the conditions which may be associated, like a basic CDC or a regular thyroid function test which may help uh, as a to pinpoint the diagnosis. And if there is uh, the definitive indi indications, like uh, from the history of physical examination, we can go for some special test like metabolic panel or uh, anti-nuclear antibody or uh, other uh, and other immune markers. And uh, the viral serology, which is very important to rule out chronic hepatitis C, uh, HIV, etc., has to be undertaken. The radiography like spine and joints uh, to uh, rule out the scoliosis and osteoarthritis uh, which may act as a trigger has to be um, uh, excluded. <coughs> now for this uh, uh, responsible pain uh, management or uh, fatigue management, we need some guideline. Hence the EULA gives us some guideline that uh, after exclusion of the comorbidities and uh, the other associated conditions which may give rise to this aches and pains or uh, we uh, come to a disease process that is fibromyalgia, first and foremost thing to do is patient education and patient education. And after that physical uh, therapy, which plays a remains role, are very much effective in controlling the disease process and, they, uh, and it was uh, actually organized in the non-pharmacological therapy uh, for this fibromyalgia patients. So patient must be educated regarding the expectation of treatment, which is very important. Now explaining this genetics, triggers, and physiology of fibromyalgia is an important adjunct to relieve the associated anxiety in these patients. They should uh, focus on improved function and quality of life rather than elimination of pain. There are some illness behaviors in, uh, which are found in this group of patients with chronic vague aches and pains. Like uh, they frequently visit uh, to the physicians and uh, they say uh, that uh, we are having pain here and pain there, but it's very ill-defined, cannot uh, uh, point out uh, where it is from. So uh, this uh, uh, patient should be educated that uh, these frequent physicians visits should be discouraged and viewers that focus on improved uh, function should be strongly encouraged. <coughs> the most important part of the non-pharmacological therapy is physical activity and exercises. Like uh, strengthening exercises and aerobic exercises uh, for 30 minutes and uh, 3 days a week helps, uh, 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 gives an immense uh, effectivity uh, in improving the pain and fatigue and improvement of the function of, of the patient. Now, uh, those patients who are not very physically active, active then uh, balinotherapy or water-based programs uh, helps a lot. Meditative movements like uh, yoga, tai chi, etc., uh, they, they have found to be effective in many uh, studies. Now, the role of PMR is definitely there and the uh, tense which reduces the movement evoked pain and fatigue or acupuncture in the multiple site to tenderness or tender points helps uh, uh, greatly. This cognitive behavioral therapy are uh, the uh, this most important strategy to improve sleep hygiene and reduce illness behaviors because these patients or patients with chronic aches and pain, they have a lot of sleep disturbances. So it is very, very helpful uh, uh, to go for uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, Euler has also emphasized upon the individual treatment. Patients uh, has to be individualized depending upon the uh, presenting symptom or the most uh, important uh, associated uh, symptoms uh, which are associated with the pain. 
if, uh, first and foremost is the psychological symptoms like depression, anxiety, and there may be other psychosocial behaviors. So mainly cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very important, but if, uh, if they don't uh, respond well to this cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, we, uh, and there are more severe depression or anxiety, then uh, psychopharmacological treatment may be added. If it is associated with severe pain, with uh, loss of uh, sleep disturbances, then there, there are several uh, pharmacological agents uh, like um, uh, SNRIs or uh, other uh, agents which improve the sleep condition, uh, they, they, can be, uh, they are often useful. But if there is severe disability with a gross sick sickness, making a patient uh, practically homebound, then multimodal rehabilitation program has to be taken, including this non-pharmacological as well as pharmacological therapies. Now before going into pharmacological therapy, we have to keep in mind about the comorbid tr triggering conditions. If there are any comorbid condition, don't jump to uh, glucocorticoids or NSAIDs. Uh, to, for controlling of the pains because they are useful for only management of the inflammatory conditions but not effective against these fibromyalgia related symptoms. And to treat fibromyalgia related symptoms, then we have to target the afferent and descending pain pathways. These are the pharmacological agents uh, uh, which are used in pharmacological in, uh, in um, this uh, sort of uh, pain, aches and pains of which most important one is muscle relaxant, uh, cyclobenzapine, 15 to 30 milligram daily, and, uh, and the trial shows up to 24 weeks, uh, can be used with uh, great efficacy. Now, antidepressants like SNRIs, I mean, triptyline, duloxetine, or milnacipran also helps a lot, and there are many, many studies which uh, has shown they have uh, improved uh, the, the, uh, these aches and pains with fatigue, uh, um, uh, up to 30 to 40 percent cases along with other agents. Now, anticonvulsants, specifically this ligand of uh, alpha-2 delta subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels, they are pregabalin and gabapentin. They have also been found to be effective in uh, some studies. Now, analgesics like tramadol uh, or, or um, uh, either uh, alone or with uh, some uh, acetaminophen has been found in uh, se uh, several trials to be helpful in uh, alleviating the symptoms. So the single uh, agent usage to treat a multiple symptom domains has been strongly encouraged. If there is pain with uh, sleep disturbances, agents as, uh, as I mentioned, such as uh, benzaprine, amitriptyline, or dapapentine or pregabalin are helpful. If there is pain with uh, fatigue uh, plus anxiety or depression, then drugs that have both analgesics as well as antidepressant or anxiolytic effects like duloxetine, uh, milaciprine, and other SNRIs may be our first choice. Now, tramadol, which is an opioid with a mild SNRI activity, has been studied in this population with indication of efficacy. But it should be highly emphasized that strong opioid analgesics are to be avoided in patients with fibromyalgia because they are addictive, uh, addictive and uh, there may be severe adverse effects. Now comes the importance of combination of drugs. There are several trials, uh, trials and studies have come out uh, with this combination drugs like uh, a low dose of uh, uh, SSRI like fluoxetine or a, uh, or a tri uh, cyclic antidepressant like amitriptyline if uh, uh, not in combination but used singly either in the morning or in the evening may, uh, has uh, shown that uh, uh, they have uh, shown a significant greater improvement in pain uh, with the combination of the agents uh, as compared to other uh, agents used alone or placebo. There are several other studies which have shown that uh, duloxetine plus pregabalin uh, shows a greater improvement in scores for pain, function and fatigue. Yes, one minute. And Several, uh, and one study has shown an antiviral like fan cyclovir in, uh, plus celicoxy in a handful of patients, hundreds of patients. Uh, they have shown uh, to, uh, 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 to be efficacious in, uh, in controlling this pain and uh, fatigue. Now, in addition, 
the meditation adherence for the combination of pregabalin with either of the any SNRIs like duloxetine or venlafaxine was better than monotherapy with each of these four medications. So there is no one solution to all the problems. So we have to individualize the problem. We have to pick up the patients according to their predominant symptoms. Uh, only the chronic patients with chronic aches and pain uh, 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 is not a present uh, presenting feature. But there are, as I have already mentioned, there are uh, several features which are associated with this, uh, like uh, psychological features like sleep disturbances. So we have to individualize patients. Then uh, we have to exclude other comorbid conditions, and we have to treat the patient accordingly using both non-pharmacological uh, methods as well as pharmacotherapy. Thank you. So here you can see narrowing of the joint space. <coughs> So here you can see three typical of the osteoarthritis, especially the, the middle side. If it is lateral, think of uh, something like trauma. So what you expect to see in osteoarthritis? Narrowing of the joint space, medial compartment narrowing, osteophytes, sclerosis, and subchondrosis. This is also an osteoarthritis in elderly. Can anyone name what type of osteoarthritis is one? You can see here. Uh, typical one type of osteoarthritis called primary osteoarthritis of the hands with erosions. So it's the erosive way. So the appearance of the erosions we call the seagull wing type of erosions, and also you you, you would see ankylosis. This is a case of severe osteoarthritis of the hips. <coughs> what is this one? Anybody can guess. This patient also randomly came with. Uh, Severe hip pains. Case of lupus, yes, sir. Thank you. So, case of lupus following excesses of steroids called pavian of the both hips. And can anyone guess what it is? Severe destruction diabetes. So, severe uh, diabetic neuropathy with uh, neuropathic joints involving the ankles. Male 53, no non alcoholic. Suffering from joint pains and swellings on and off, exacerbated by drink and uh, red meat. Lab test showed high uric acid, has not been on any regular medication. So, with this, you can guess what it is. Yes. So, so this is a case of gout, tophaceous gout. You can see nice punched out erosions in the, in the feet. So the, the type of erosions what we see here is punched out erosions with sclerotic margins with wall hanging edges. This is very typical of gouty arthritis. But whenever you see a case of gout, if you diagnose quite early and if you counsel the patient properly and if he has been on medication for a long time, he will not get these kind of erosions. So you have to counsel the patient. What, what usually they do is they stop the medication after a couple of months. So if they have been on regular proper diet, low purine diet plus continue, you know, continue lowering, uh, uric uh, acid lowering agents for lifelong. Never ever stop medication for gout once it is confirmed. Some more radiological changes. Tophaceous gout. 
is a new, new modality of uh, diagnosing gout. Generally, I have CT. We don't normally do it. Whenever there is a doubt about gout, suppose someone can have more than one type, like rarely, you know, psoriatic, psoriatic arthritis plus gout. So, especially in case of uh, atypical presentations, you can uh, use GM and a GCT to diagnose gout. <coughs> the green areas are uh, gouty lesions. Men 45, complaints of pain and swelling in the joints for eight years, asymmetrical arthritis, nail dystrophy, nail pitting, father had psoriasis. So, typical history is psoriatic arthritis. So, here you see marginal erosions and also just jextraarticular newborn formation. And another type of erosion is what we call here uh, mouth, mouse ears type of erosions here. And you can see severe osteolysis in the carpal bones. And what type of deformity is this one? Anyone can guess? <clears throat> Pencil cup deformity. And also here you can see uh, some more things like subluxation and uh, osteolysis. <coughs> uh, this is a case of angular spawn like this, and this is a red cup. What's the difference? Here you see things in this one finds here that are bulky. So the other name for this bucket handle type of syndesmophiles, very bulky syndesmophiles. <coughs> and also here you can see um, pencil cup deformity. So whenever you say case of uh, psoriatic arthritis, yeah, any type of arthritis, especially if it's symmetrical, always examine the skin and also look for the nail prints and uh, ask the family history. Most of them they deny. So specifically you have to ask family history. Another case, 45 year old uh, female, symmetrical polyarthritis, Rumdart factor positive, ESR 65, high ESR. So any symmetrical polyarthritis is we have to think of rheumatoid arthritis. So in this case, high ESR rheumatoid factor positive. So what you expect to see in a case of rheumatoid arthritis? Joint space narrowing, erosions, and periodical osteoporosis. The joint space is uniform. And erosions, type of erosions, marginal or central erosions. And uh, late cases, you see ankylosis of the joint. Here you see lots of erosions, destruction, subluxation. And what is the difference between uh, the first case of knee x-ray and this one? The first unilateral, medial joint space narrowing. You can see here, it is bicompartmental disease. So this is secondary to rheumatoid arthritis. That's how we can differentiate the primary osteoarthritis or secondary osteoarthritis. So this is secondary OA, secondary to rheumatoid arthritis. And also it can affect the atlantoaxial joints causing atlantoaxial dislocation. Another case for the same old male, low back pain 20 years, joint pains and swellings for 10 years, Asymmetric arthritis, bilateral necklace tendinitis, and heel pain. So anybody can guess with history? Ankylosing spondylitis. So how to differentiate, uh, uh, is it SPA or not? Just by asking one extra question to the patient, do you have back pain? Patient says yes. How long it is? If it is lasting longer than 45 minutes roughly, you are dealing with inflammatory back pain. Then the patient has got peripheral arthritis, probably it is spondyl arthritis. So this is a bamboo spine, bilateral cycle, cyclic joint involvement, erosions. So I expect to see, to see erosions, 
sclerosis, and also in late cases, ankylosis. You can see here bamboo spine, thin syndesmophytes, and fusion of bilateral SL joints. And also on the MRI, you can see bone edema. If it is radiologically, x ray is very much clear, we don't need to ask for mm. MRI. Here you, on the spine, you see Romnos lesions and Anderson lesions. Romnos lesions are, what are they? This is due to enthesitis at endless insertions of the vertebrae and plates. Anderson lesions are due to spondylodiscitis. These are the Anderson lesions. Male 61, this phase yeah, low back pain, neck pain, decreased spine mobility. Can anybody guess what it is? Flowing gastrophytes. So this is due to calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament. And here what we are seeing is, whenever a patient comes with a back pain with uh, x-ray looking like this, other definition is ankylosis spondylitis. Here you can see the SI joints are normal. That's how you can differentiate this dish from uh, uh, ankylosis spondylitis. Here you, you see that disc spaces are well preserved and SI joints are normal. So in dish, disc spaces will be normal and SI joints will be normal. And what is this? A 45 year old female with a back pain. This is osteitis condensed on layer. So this is a physiological phenomena. You see the multi-parous human. Like a year old female, pain and swelling of the ankles for six months, edema nodosum on the legs. Bilateral hyalami color. Whenever you see any uh, ankle arthritis with edema nodosum, how do you diagnose edema nodosum? Painful tender lesions, especially on the legs, on the ankle arthritis. Think of sarcoidosis and new chest flexion, maybe AS level scansion that will give more clues to the most diagnosis. You may have to find tightening of the skin involving the forearms, hands, legs and feet, sclerodactyly. So this is a case of sclerodactyly. Partialisis and calcifications. Jakor's arthropathy. Jakor's arthropathy, reversible deformities. They look like rotator hands, but you can actually, if you try, you can reverse the deformities. Especially you see in lupus. May 50, left ankle pain and swelling for one day. Right tika three weeks ago. So our aspiration is leukocytosis, eutrophil predominant, rhombard-shaped crystals. So this is a case of CPPD. Hemochromatosis. You see here, look like the osteophytes. In the MCP joints, especially from second to fifth MCP joints. So it's a case of his Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Dr. Sir. Uh, may I invite both the speakers uh, to the can cause this kind of pain which can mimic and lastly generalized pain can be due to elderly people with the metastatic bone disease. With a young patient it may not be applicable, but middle-aged lady, particularly vegans, may have B12 deficiency and that come with a non-specific pain. I think in elderly group, people after the age of 45 or 50, one should always inquire the fibromyalgia, mimics of fibromyalgia, that is an important one. And Dr. Sarat, whatever you have shown, these are all advanced diseases. In the early case detection, radiology has got a minimum role. Obviously, go by the other methods. These are all advanced disease when actually almost end stage. 
where you can't do anything except the knee replacement or hip replacement. So obviously radiology by itself has got limitation, simple radiology. When we have to take records of other things, particularly MRI or CT scan, whatever you need. That has to be emphasized in gathering where uh, postgraduate internal physicians are there for studying the early cases. It is also important. Thank you. Sir, one more point I would like to add here for your, for your comments. I think you mentioned vitamin D also. Pardon? Vitamin D. For further knowledge. What? No, no, yeah. Yeah, but no, nowadays, with a lot of vitamin D deficiency, we have been seeing patients for the past one, two decades. Hyperventilus D is presenting as diffuse body pains. So, especially among the doctors and the IT professionals, is rampant. And also, after the account of literature, the upset to sleep apnea can also cause fibromyalgia like symptoms. So, whenever patients say fibromyalgia type of symptoms, think of uh, uh, no, ask the snoring and do sleep studies and take a proper action. Thank you. Uh, just one comment on the question that. Mentioned about this mean curse. Sir, I have mentioned about the endocrine causes uh, like hypo and hyperthyroidism as well as hyperparathyroidism. Uh, there are uh, several many mimickers, and including uh, this metabolic panel. I have uh, mentioned that if if uh, the history and physical examination suggest, uh, then we should go for this uh, special test like uh, uh, we should have vitaminosis D or B12 uh, deficiencies. These are uh, all comes in the metabolic to uh, exclude because the first and foremost thing is to exclude the mimickers and the comorbid conditions. That is very important for managing this exam phase. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I am Dr. Gautam Dhar Chaudhary, I am the HOD Rheumatology of Command Hospital, Calcutta. I just have a comment on the topic presented by Dr. Mrs. Sarbani Sindhika. Madam, recently we all attended the Jerry Account Conference at uh, Calcutta and my concern is more to the patients who receives questionnaire with sensitivity and specificity that can diagnose fibromyalgia if you just tick a few points there and it has been confirmed that it's extremely useful. So a disease which is difficult otherwise to diagnose, by using that uh, protocol, you can make a fairly accurate diagnosis of uh, fibromyalgia. Anyone who wants that, I can send it. Give me a, your email address and I can send that. Thank you. This is Dr. Anupama from Bangalore. In studies, it has proven value. And uh, more uh, dry lifting is a question. And, uh, yeah. No, no, no. no. Uh, but means uh, that the multiple side to tender points, the uh, uh, needling of the multiple side tender points is a uh, sort of acupuncture. So it has a definite, definite value and a lot of other physical exercises. No, so rarely we do see, so like in children, in the circus, we don't see several authors exactly can mimic like fibromyalgia. So, uh, I think in the general practice, it may be difficult to diagnose, but we have to keep that in mind. So, whenever you suspect uh, uh, this, so examine the inside the sites, and um, if, if, if the if they are tender, then uh, do appropriate investigations. Uh, young persons or young children think of this one, I do with the uh, inflammatory If at all you think of it is an inflammatory condition. So you have history taking, history taking, and history taking, physical examination, physical examination, physical examination. The base uh, line for the general practitioners and the postgraduates. Occasionally, we also see patient is complaining only chest wall pain, like you know, diffuse costochondritis. When we examine, everything is normal. Then ask for extra questions like inflammatory back pain, history of psoriasis, any nail dystrophy. So these are very important. So it can again mimic like fibromyalgia, but probably it's inter-site is either. You know, you some sort of thing.
inspection, otherwise they go up to cardiologist, they do, uh, you know, treadmill and angiogram, everything would be normal. So, it be a three, typical, so we get chest pains, it can be due to severe bit medial deficiency, or intersectors, secondary to underlying spinal artery. This was a very engaging and educative session. We now close the session. Thank you one and all. Illness in the family, and we have a standing chairperson as well. Anyway, I'll try and do my best to address the topic, which is assessing disease in a case of rheumatoid arthritis in the community. Now, the first uh, challenge or assessment problem that we would face would be to see whether a patient who presents to us with joint pains actually has rheumatoid arthritis. As we have seen during the morning, all joint pain and in fact not even all inflammatory joint pain is rheumatoid arthritis. So the first step would be to clinically evaluate a patient and come to a reasonable diagnosis that this is indeed rheumatoid arthritis. And then, as we know, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease. Assess whether the patient has any systemic or extra-articular features. Once that is done, the next step would be to actually quantify the disease in terms of disease activity and in terms of joint involvement, because this would then enable us to plan appropriate therapy and then monitor the response to that treatment eventually perhaps de-escalate to maintenance therapy. Over a period of time, joint damage or disability might need to be assessed. Now, what I would try and do in the next 15 odd minutes is focus on these three aspects, not to say that this is not important, but time would not allow doing everything. <coughs> so what is the diagnosis or how do we diagnose rheumatoid? I think it's important to emphasize and most speakers all through the day have already done that, that this is a clinical diagnosis and essentially rests upon recognizing the pattern of joint involvement in a given patient with inflammatory joint disease. Now inflammation would be indicated by pain, swelling and stiffness at the affected joints and the characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis would be a symmetrical involvement of the small and large peripheral joints. The classical joints would be the small joints of the hands and feet and then in addition knees, elbows, shoulders. If these are inflamed, this would be the classical presentation of rheumatoid arthritis. And if, that, if to that we add that this is a persistent inflammation, going on for at least six weeks, we are thinking more or less in terms of possible rheumatoid arthritis. Now this pattern of joint involvement could be either a gradual progression where the patient would present initially with two or three joints and then add on over a period of time. It could be episodic or what's called palindromic where a single joint gets inflamed, lasts for 24 to 48 hours and settles down and then over a period of time this, these episodes gradually merge into a symmetrical polyarthritis. It could be polymyalgic where predominantly the muscle pain and stiffness predominates and there a differential diagnosis of polymyalgia rheumatica might need to be considered or it could be an explosive rapid onset which tends to be seen in the elderly. The most common of course is the gradual additive presentation. And it's important to stress that the spine, axial spine or the axial joints are not involved. So if a patient, in addition to peripheral joint involvement, has inflammatory back or symptoms suggestive of inflammatory back pain, we would need to rethink our diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, in addition to the typical joint involvement, the patient over a period of time may have systemic features which could be a low-grade fever, lethargy, tiredness, weight loss, muscle wasting, and over a certain period of time, develop an anemia of chronic disease. Systemic extra-articular features could be subcutaneous nodules, more commonly dry eyes. This is a very extreme example of sclerobalacia, but dry eyes or scleritis, it would be more common. They could have permanent involvement in terms of pleural effusion 
or inflammatory lung disease or a peripheral neuropathy or vasculitis. Fortunately, when we try and make a diagnosis early, we tend not to see these systemic features, but we need to keep these in mind while making our assessment in a patient of possible rheumatoid arthritis. Now, when should we not, when, when is it not rheumatoid? When there is an absence of upper limb synovitis, particularly the wrist and the MCP joints are spared, we should think twice before making a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Similarly, if one or at the most two or three joints are involved and particularly lower limb joints like the knees or ankles, we should rethink. It's probably more likely that it's a case of spondyl arthritis and particularly if there is inflammatory low back pain as well. Asymmetrical involvement should cause us to rethink and if there are marked systemic features, prolonged fever, skin rash, photosensitivity, Raynaud's phenomenon, and urinary or renal abnormalities, particularly an active urine sediment with protein or cells, should make us rethink the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So this would be the typical clinical picture, as we have just discussed, the typical joint pattern, plus minus with or without uh, certain systemic or extra-articular features. And most of these can be uh, ascertained by a good history and a physical examination. The crux would be to assess and diagnose rheumatoid early, possibly before some of these features uh, occur. And in that, could certain investigations help us? Serology might, rheumatoid factor and the anti-CCP antibody. However, we should keep in mind that not all patients who have rheumatoid factor positivity will have rheumatoid arthritis and not all patients who have rheumatoid will be CCP positive. But if somebody has a suggestive history of joint involvement and also has rheumatoid factor and CCP positivity, that would strengthen our diagnosis towards an early diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Inflammatory markers wouldn't necessarily tell us that it's rheumatoid, but might tell us that certain joint symptoms in a patient are inflammatory in nature. Radiology, as was pointed out, is a late feature, but sometimes early on, what we may see is soft tissue swelling and periarticular osteoporosis, which is non-specific, but might help to strengthen the diagnosis in a typical patient. And if we do see this, a very early, small, marginal erosion, then that would also strengthen our diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So having made an assessment that the patient who has presented to us with joint pains has a typical pattern of rheumatoid arthritis, may or may not have systemic or extra articular features, how do we then quantify the disease or assess the disease activity? This necessarily would mean somehow quantifying the joint involvement. Now, as we can see, there are almost 68 to 70 joints in the body. And over the years, various possible counts have been uh, evolved or devised to try and uh, assess or quantify joint damage, starting from 66 to 68 joint counts, the Ricci index, which was 52 joints, and so on. Problem has been, how do you assess? Because swelling, tenderness, motion, deformity, do you do it as a single uh, criteria or do you take zero to four? So there's never really been any consensus. Plus it became very complex to do an, on a routine clinical examination. A 28 joint count, and this was detected much earlier, does tend to be simple. If you look at the MCP, PIP joints and the wrists, elbows, shoulders and the knees, and this tends to correlate well with other parameters of disease activity. And taking this in mind, a few composite disease indices have been devised. One is the DAS-28. There are two or three variations of it, but this is one with the ESR. The actual calculation is a complex mathematical formula, but there are DAS calculators. 
where one feeds in the number of tender joints, swollen joints, ESR, and a global assessment of the patient on a 0 to 100 visual analog scale, and you get the DAS score. Between 2.6 to 3.2 is low disease activity, 3.2 to 5.1 will be moderate, and above 5.1 is uh, 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 severe disease activity. Similarly, two other indices have also been derived. One is the simplified disease activity index, which looks at the tender joint, swollen joint, and a global assessment of the patient and the physician, plus the CRP. And these are indices indicating low, moderate, or severe disease activity, and less than 3.3 would be remission. This includes the CRP, but without that also, if we just use the clinical parameters of tender joint, swollen joint, and a global physician and patient, we can still find that this correlates well in terms of disease activity assessment. And this we can see here, remission, both in the CDI, SDI, and the DAS28 would be less than these low, moderate, and high disease activity indices. There are many other measures that have been uh, devised, which are patient-reported measures of disease activity and response to treatment, which look at joint pain, function, and the global estimate of the patient. In terms of activity, we have the radar, which is a rapid assessment of disease activity, and the rapid, which is routine assessment, and we have rapid 3, 4, and 5. Response criteria, the most uh, popular one, the most uh, widely used one would be the ACR response criteria, which looks at 20, 50, or 70 percent response to these two parameters plus three out of these five. And then you have the assessment of function, activities of daily living, short form 36, health assessment questionnaires, and the quality of life measures. Now this may be too uh, complicated to go into detail, but in summary, what I will try and do is uh, put across or summarize a clinical vignette where we take the case of a 34-year-old lady who presents with a year and a half history of symmetrical joint inflammation involving the small and large joints. So these would be the MCP joints, the wrists, elbows, shoulders, knees, ankles, and she has swelling, stiffness, morning stiffness, lasts more than two hours, she has low-grade fever, and is tired. Now this is a typical history that one would uh, make one think of rheumatoid arthritis. Now at this point in the, in the community, one might like to refer this patient to a specialist for further evaluation, or if one would like to go ahead, one might do some investigations, so ESR uh, as a measure of inflammation is raised. She has positive rheumatoid factor and CCP. When we clinically assess her, she has tender joint count of 18, swollen joint 16, ESR 54, and her own assessment of uh, global assessment on a 0 to 100 scale is 75. So when we calculate the DAS 28, her DAS score comes to 7.34, and remember the high disease activity is more than 5.1, and if we calculate the clinical disease activity index, it's 49. Again, high disease activity being more than 22. So this lady has a rheumatoid arthritis and has very really active disease. Now how does it help us in treatment? So when she first presents, the same assessment is made. She started on anti-inflammatories, given an intramuscular steroid, and started on hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate, with methotrexate being escalated to 20 milligrams after four weeks. Now when she comes back after three months, she is better. The DAS 28 has now reduced to 5.02, and any improvement in the DAS of more than 1.2 is considered to be improvement but she still has active joint inflammation and her DAS score is still in the high range. So at that time her disease modifying drugs are modified. She has given intra-articular injections to her knees. 
And then she is seen again after three months when the gas has again reduced, but she still has some degree of activity in that her DAS score is 3.09. So therapy is modified again, and when she's seen after three months, uh, another three months, so nine months from onset, her DAS score is now 1.6. She has no tender joints, no swollen joints, and her ESR is nine. So this lady then has gone into clinical remission. So I hope uh, this sort of illustrates the value of disease assessment uh, in managing a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, sir. That was really nice and summarizes rheumatoid arthritis very clearly, including the treatment also, in a very short span of time. Uh, uh, if there are any questions, Please stand up and introduce yourself. Or any comments? Uh, do you prefer uh, escalating the doses or giving at the maximum dose and then tapering them down once the patient is uh, on the patient? Or can the dance? Uh, um, I, this was actually one of my patients, so what was done here is what generally I do. Uh, once the initial control is achieved, then one might de-escalate to a maintenance regime. So like in this lady, she was eventually controlled on methotrexate and leflunamide. Uh, one might eventually scale down the leflunamide to 10 milligrams and maybe bring the uh, methotrexate down to 20 or even 50 milligrams. Uh, I have one question, sir. You have mentioned that this patient had received intramuscular 80 milligram of uh, dipometrol, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, would you prefer uh, oral instead or? Uh, well, that's also very standard regime. Yes. In fact, many people would use a, a, a short period of low-dose oral steroids that yes. can also be done. The, the point is that even if we give intramuscular or we inject intraarticular, the patient is receiving a steroid of, you know, to help with the uh, overall disease control. Yes. Yes, please. So Dr. Vishal Maha's daughter. Introduce yeah. yourself. Yeah. Come forward. Take a mic. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Drishti Maha. I'm doing my DXT in uh, Economic Impact of RA. And I actually wanted to ask, sir, in your treatment regime, for example, uh, you didn't mention much about disability, like hack DI and stuff. When you said the DAS, for example, as a doctor, I understand that's how you would be assessing. But would, does disability play an important role in how you assess? Yes, it does. And the, there are two reasons I didn't mention that in this talk. One, this was directed towards the community and general physicians. The other, if, in this case, the duration of illness was about a year and a half. So had the duration been longer, had she had established joint damage, then yes, that would have become even more important. And in fact, as part of our treatment, that assessment would be important before we planned uh, treatment. For example, if a patient has active disease, but has a number of damaged joints, like for example, knee involvement or hip involvement, at that point, one might have to address that rather than uh, escalating the disease-modifying therapy. Uh, right, so that was because, uh, just, just to follow up, sir, you also mentioned about quality of life, and you didn't go into that. Again, just I know I understand that you did, but uh, just the fact that you did mention, I would just ask you to uh, elaborate a little on your perspective. Uh, this may not be the exact forum to elaborate on that. As you know, there, there are very may, very many variations on that. Uh, so maybe later on one can. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. But thank you for the question. Yes, please. Sukma Mukherjee, sir. Uh, Dr. Mukta, sir. thank you for excellent presentation. But what I think that at the first visit or second visit, I think if you teach the patients, there are some very educational young girl 
who knows all about this, they can go to the or uh, come all the electronic gadgets and they can do it SDI better than C than the dash 28. And periodic interval SDI can have a, some cooperation and possibly compliance will be better for the patient education as well as continuation of treatment. <coughs> so SDI may be have for age over the dash 28 Absolutely, in, I agree. in terms of the clinical care for a long term disease like this. Eventually, I think what an individual gets used to is what they tend to, you know, use. I mean, I what I do is I take the indices first, and then the dash 28 can be calculated later or if and need be. Download from the laptop. Exactly, the calculator is there. Yeah, so it doesn't take very long at all. Patient education is very important in that sense in a long term care. Absolutely. Good morning. Please tell your name and ask your question. I am Dr. Rajat Pratham. Sir, the newer guidelines suggest you hope that uh, we should prefer methotrexate monotherapy in cases of rheumatoid arthritis. So, why should take on uh, uh, use of LCQ, leflunomide, and sulfacilazin? Yes, and uh, when to add all these uh, uh, these drugs? Uh, some people, some physicians refer uh, they add all the drugs at the same time. Some are like no, go with the guidelines. So, what should you do? See, well, the emphasis of this talk was not to focus on the treatment part. It was to emphasize how assessment of disease activity helps in getting the patient to come to a low disease activity or remission. At the end of the day, no matter what treatment you use, as long as they are standard drugs in an adequate, appropriate doses, that achieves your target is what's important. So what other regimes have also, some people start with a single drug, some might start with three drugs, and then de-escalate they're all perfectly uh, uh, appropriate. Everyone can, uh, every drug has its side effects. So what's the ideal situation as a uh, practitioner that can never question, that can never be Yeah, done. one thing which I perhaps omitted to emphasize was that in addition to the <coughs> disease assessment, it's, all, it's very important to monitor for drug side effects. So. At the same time as the disease modifying drugs are being given, the patient's hematology, renal function, liver functions as required, depending on the drug that we are using, or ocular assessment, if one is using hydroxychloroquine, that's very important. But the talk was focused on disease assessment, so that's why some of those things were not highlighted. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the nice talk. Overlap would be there, but I think it makes things better to understand. So I'll be speaking on common medications in rheumatological diseases. I'll be touching on NSAIDs and conventional synthetic DMRs. Now, keeping the time in mind and, you know, the uh, that there are two elements of the talk. I thought it will be more important to cover certain relevant aspects rather than going into pharmacology and other things. Now, NSAIDs, we all know, have a major role in management of RA. They inhibit activity of cyclooxygenase, resulting in reduced synthesis of prostaglandins. COX-2 inhibition leads to reduction in inflammation. And COX-1 inhibition can cause adverse effects like bleeding and gastritis. These, as you are familiar with the arachidonic acid pathway, COX-1, COX-1 and 2. Now, we have selective COX-2 inhibitors like atoricoxib, silicoxib, lumericoxib, valdicoxib. They cause reduced GI side effects. However, there are questions raised about their cardiovascular events. Now, what is the what are the modes of action of NSA? Inhibition of formation of toxic oxygen radicals, inhibition of prostaglandin leukotriene synthesis, inhibition of neutrophil aggregation, adhesion and chemotaxis, uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, inhibited uptake of arachidonate and central analgesia. So there are multiple mechanisms of action, modes of action. Non-selective COX inhibitors, if we look at the, we have the salicylates like aspirin, indoles like indomethacin, 
propionic acid like naproxen, brufen, ibuprofen, acetic acid like diclofenac, aciclofenac, etrodolac, etorolac, and oxycams like the pyroxicam, eloxicam, and lornoxicam. What are the salient issues by using NSAIDs? I think when I was doing my rheumatology at AIMS, you know, once I remember uh, Dr. Malvi had come and he once said that, you know, painkillers are plain killers. So I still remember that. And he was mentioning that one of the commonest cause for raised SGOT, SGBT are the NSAIDs, not necessarily methotrexate. So in my last 20 odd years as a rheumatologist, I have not used NSAIDs too much. I'll tell you why. One is the usage of steroid. Second is intra-articular injection. So it is very important that you address these. You will not need to use too much of NSAID. I haven't used much in my practice. Very limited. Don't combine two NSAIDs. Sometimes you will come across prescriptions where two NSAIDs have been combined. It's not logical. NSAIDs and paracetamol can be combined. <coughs> Avoid combining NSAIDs and steroids, although it may happen for a short duration. <coughs> NSAIDs don't alter the course of disease in RA. And basically, the maximum is to start DMRs at the earliest. So, that is something you know one should learn is, if your prescription must contain a DMR to start with, whether it is methotrexate, monotherapy or combination, that is a secondary issue. At the end, guideline is a guideline. Finally, practice depends on how you practice, how you will, you know, evolve over a period of time. There are many things which will be there. Now, salient issues while using NSAIDs, watch for gastrointestinal, CDS, renal adverse effects. Before starting NSAIDs, evaluate properly. Start with lower dose and increase slowly. In a chronic inflammatory disease, change only after 7 to 10 days of use, if not effective. During substitution due to lack of efficacy or side effects, use another NSAID from different chemical class of the previous drug. Long-acting NSAIDs when given at night are useful in reducing morning stiffness. Now, so what are the strategies for reducing DI side? So first thing I like to highlight, if you are giving too long, you know, NSAIDs, you should review your thought process. Like somebody has an inflamed knee, you are continuing to give, say, a toricoxib for one month. I think you should target the knee, aspirate inject you know and if the pain is due to long standing say a patient is having disease for 10 years and it is degenerative that does the patient need an anti-inflammatory or needs analgesic like maybe paracetamol or a paracetamol tramadol combination i think these are things you should always keep in mind enteric coating of tablet or dispersible forms concomitant use of h2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors Intermittent NSAID use, use COX-2 selective NSAIDs <laughs> and no concomitant steroids, avoid. So one thing when you are using, you know, NSAIDs, like sometimes, you know, disease flares, so you are giving, so many people know that old maximum of steroids are very bad, you know, that kind of thing. A lot of people have that in mind, especially if you find they are very much hesitant of using st uh, steroid. They are more comfortable giving NSAID for a longer time. All those things must be in your mind. Like somebody says, sir, the steroid causes uh, osteoporosis. But remember, when the mobility improves, that has also to be weighed in. Even immobility causes osteoporosis. So this was about the NSAIDs. I think you would know NSAIDs better than me. I, mean, I use NSAIDs very, very less. To be honest, very less. In fact, if I would start injection methyl prednisolone 80 mg weekly for 4 weeks, I don't expect beyond 3rd, 4th day, you know, or a week NSA would be continued. Right? Now coming to conventional synthetic DMRs. So we have methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, leflunomide, cyclosporin A, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, parental gold and deep penicillin. 
how to initiate DMRs, especially methotrexate. Basically, you can use a steroid bridge or NSAIDs as methotrexate will take some time to act, say 6 to 8 weeks. Methotrexate monotherapy starting with 10 to 15 mg with folic acid 5 mg weekly and increase the dose up to 25-30 mg weekly. It all depends on your level of you know comfort. Generally, we would go up to 25. I would go up to 25. Beyond 15 mg weekly, better to give subcutaneous or IF. This is very important. When you are increasing beyond 15, say even 17.5 or 20, it is better you can switch over to subcutaneous or intramuscular weekly. Oral dose of methotrexate more than 15 mg weekly can be split into two doses. Suppose patient is on 25 mg, we can give 15 mg in the morning and 10 mg at night. So at gap of 12 hours. This has been highlighted by Professor Rohini Handai, his you know, book on rheumatoid arthritis. Very, very practical, especially for young you know, practitioners. I would recommend you to read his book. Stop methotrexate three months before planning a pregnancy. You are aware of the teratogenic effect. Methotrexate induced ILD is extremely rare. For mild to moderate ILD with RA, methotrexate can be continued. So see, if suppose a patient has RA with mild ILD, so it's not a great idea. Remember, always remember that methotrexate is a sheet anchor drug and it is a less expensive drug. It's very comparatively being weekly dosing, it's a very you know, for economic point of view, is very much accessible. There is no cumulative dose beyond which methotrexate cannot be continued. If clinically needed and if an LFT is normal, carry on with methotrexate. CBC, LFT, RFT, repeat 2 to 3 monthly. Check x ray PAU should be done before starting therapy. Combination therapy in severe disease. So we can have like what Sir was mentioning a patient with a TAS score of 7.12 you were mentioning about methotrexate monotherapy but they at nowhere it is written that you cannot combine you know, to start with I think. And you see 7 is this patient if you see 16, 18 swollen tender joints is very very severe disease. I would also be tempted to start with 2 or 3 drugs in the beginning. I would not like to start only with monotherapy for a patient like that. So here a lot of your own experience comes in, you know, everybody, like somebody said oral steroid 10 milligram to start with and then reduce, somebody would give methyl bread intramuscular weekly for 4 weeks, somebody would give 80 into 2 weeks, then 60 into 2, all these you know you will find. I think that is the way of practice, there will be some difference you know and also how comfortable you are with a particular drug. Everybody may not be comfortable with all drugs. That point also to be kept in mind. You can combine methotrexate with sulfasalazine. Methotrexate with leflunomide, you know, the liver toxicity will be high. So you have to monitor the LFT very closely. Methotrexate with hydroxychloroquine. Methotrexate with profacetamide and with biological DMRs. So these are the various, you know, combinations which are possible. <laughs> Remember that sulfur salicylic is expensive in conventional synthetic DMR. So it's very important because see, when you write, always be very very thoughtful as to whether the person for whom you are writing can he buy the drug. How much will it cost him? You know, like say twenty, you have something. It's not weekly; it's daily. I remember one patient. I was not doing very well on methotrexate. Low. I was thinking of adding. I looked at him, you know, I was talking. He told me, sir, this I can't, give it. this 600 rupees a day for this drug will be very difficult for me to. So, you know, I was looking at different options. So, these are things you should always keep in practice because uh, after all, you have to keep sustainability for the patient to buy the drug. Sulfasalazine, I mentioned, monitor eye toxicity with hydroxychloroquine. 
methotrexate, leflunomide, sulfasalazine, monitor, CBC, LFT, RFT closely. Tight control of disease activity is the goal. This is very important. I think what sir was mentioning, Professor Mukherjee sir was saying, you know, that keeping track. So if it is what we have found, that whatever you do, the tighter the control. So if you are going to see a patient, you know, <laughs> after say three months, or he is not accessible, he cannot contact you. I think those are the areas where challenges will come. Because suppose in between he has a flare in the left knee. And if he is accessible, you aspirate and you know, next day he will be comfortable. Those are the areas which you have to keep. So it, these are practices all a very complex thing. No? Some people are coming from outstation. Accessibility to contact you, whether you are in private practice, government practice, so many paradigms are there. So it's not very easy to you know, give any solution. But tight control means the decision making person has to be accessible. If your accessibility is inadequate, that's the point one has to keep in mind. Leflunomide already was covered. I mentioned about the teratogenicity also. Bone marrow depression. This is something, you know, we very, once it is, basically sometimes when your patient is on leflunomide or methotrexate, they go into bone marrow depression. That's something you have to keep in mind. You may have to you know, use colony stimulating factors also and then you may have to do a cholesterol wash out. It is I think 8 gram 3 times a day for 11 days. And it is available from the uh, company also provides. I remember I had a case like this, one or two cases I remember and it is very useful. You get the levels down very fast. Pregnancy. Methotrexate and leflunomide are contraindicated in pregnancy. Sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine sulfate, azathioprine, cyclosporin are safe, and steroids can also be used safely in this in pregnancy. Well, this is also more or less mentioning about the same what I mentioned. Then the this is, I was not rituximab is no, and anti-TNF agents can be used. And why I mentioned gold, somebody might think, why gold? I'll tell you, in chronic liver disease, you don't have too many options there. If you can't use methotrexate, sulfasalazine, it's got rheumatoid. What are the drugs in your armamentarium? I remember one patient used to respond very well to gold. And uh, it wasn't easy to get. Like from Nath Brothers in Delhi, he would you know, procure that. It's not available easily. So, 50 milligram weekly, doing very well on that. I just mentioned that. To conclude, tight control of rheumatoid is the key. See, how effectively you control the disease with pharmacological, non-pharmacological therapy. All those things will be very important. Frequent follow-ups. Proper assessment prior to starting drugs, very important. NSAIDs and steroids are mainly used as bridge, bridge therapy and in flare out disease. Methotrexate is the sheet anchor drug, without any doubt. Multiple drugs improve options, especially in chronic liver disease, pregnancy and other conditions. And keep a close watch on adverse effects. Thank you very much. for that excellent and very practical talk and tips on how to uh, manage medications in rheumatic diseases. Uh, I invite questions from the house. Yes, please. Can you tell your name and ask questions? Sir, this is Dr. Nassimari from Mahakasu. So I would like to know, use of HCQS in the first trimester of pregnancy, lot of gynecologists are not willing to continue HCQS in the first trimester, and high dose steroid also they are avoiding, and telling the patients that it is not safe. So I want to clarity on that point. Proxy chloroquine, so I haven't, at least, I'm not aware of any uh, studies which have shown that it is safe. And steroids are also safe. High dose steroids are also safe. Yes. Yeah. First yeah. trimester. Yeah. There is no. Yeah, Pulse, uh, methyl pregnancy in pregnancy. Some gynecologists uh, do. 
But literature evidence is not available. And steroids also, like high dose steroids generally, like I don't know how much of your meaning, something like lymphatic pulse or something. Yeah, yeah. There's no literature actually. Maybe I say one to say something. Can I just say something? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, को mic दो ना यार. Give the microphone. Mic, sir. Please. These two talks have been absolutely outstanding. Yes, sir. Of course, uh, Dr. Gupta is an old friend and uh, senior most uh, practicing rheumatologist. Uh, slightly old also, <laughs> slightly, <laughs> yeah, slightly older than you. <laughs> and Marwa, I am really happy that you are flying the AIMS flag as strongly as possible. You, you took all the lessons which Ashok must have taught you in Honda. I had by then gone, but well, there's my a... legacy was going on. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine, but I would like to just uh, emphasize a few points. I have often found that those who are, they may be brilliant, they have done their DM and, and uh, DNB and, yeah, and practice, but they are not comfortable with a drug called methotrexate. And methotrexate is my child. Um, I described in 1968 the use of methotrexate in one of the earliest papers in Lancet uh, in WMR site. So, I, you know, I know about it. I would like to mention something which he started with. NSAIDs, can you believe it? I have not given NSAIDs in any patient of rheumatoid in the last at least 25 years. Maybe 30. Yeah, well, George, you were there in Ames with me. Since then, we have never used NSAIDs. There is no need to give NSAIDs. Because once you start proper doses of BMAN and a bridging therapy with a glucocorticoid, you don't need NSAIDs. And NSAIDs combination with um, uh, synthetic BMARs is poison. Combine methotrexate with NSAIDs and see what happens to the liver and bone marrow and kidney. So this has to be kept in mind. Secondly, beautifully mentioned, Low dose methotrexate is a different drug. There is another drug which resembles a similar name, and our wonderful colleagues who treat cancer they use it. That's a separate drug, we don't know much about it. Of course, I can tell you the difference. There are three major enzymes that are suppressed by methotrexate, and one of them, DHFR, needs astronomical doses of methotrexate to suppress that. And DHFR is the main enzyme to synthesize DNA. And DNA is necessary for cell proliferation. So when you are giving 13 grams, 10 grams, 5 grams, 500 milligrams daily for 10 days, that's our colleagues who treat cancers. At that level, DHFR can be suppressed up to 95%. Even at that dose, methotrexate does not completely suppress DHFR, which means nature has made DHFR so important because it is important for life, for DNA. So you can never really suppress fully, but you can suppress this to the extent that cancer cells that require much bigger doses of folate enzymes will die and GI tract, bone marrow, <coughs> mucosa will suffer, but we will survive. And we need immediate folinic acid as a rescue treatment if you give gram doses. That is the drug which we never use in rheumatology. There is another drug and that drug is in milligrams, two log orders lower than what you use in malignancy. Two log orders. It does not touch DHFR. So we are not giving any cytotoxic drugs when we give the drug that Marwa mentioned, which is the anchor drug for treating rheumatoid. Never forget that no other drug works unless methotrexate is at the background, except uh, tocilizumab, IL-6 inhibitor. In a rare case that I just cannot tolerate methotrexate. That's one of the issues. 
That is the only place. And just three days ago, I waste my time in the morning, three hours just reading. I will give it up very soon and go for retirement. But anyway, I have this bad habit of reading. Three days ago, first paper came. Control trial has shown second drug which can replace methotrexate. But the patient will have to sell their own drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't worry. Keep giving methotrexate. Then, how does it work? There are three other enzymes. One of them leads to, and I won't go in um, detail, I-car to Pi-car and I-car T. I-car to Pi-car stops I-car T. These are the three enzymes. I-car T suppresses this conversion of I-car to Pi-car. And when I-car increases in amount in the blood, it starts releasing adenosine. And all the actions of low-dose methotrexate are absolutely safe, only the release adenosine. The only little side effect is CNS has receptors for adenosine. So, oh, don't take Malvia's name, I start vomiting. Don't show his clinic, you know, I feel vomitous. Why? Because adenosine goes and attacks CNS and methotrexate aversion, this is called anticipatory side effect to methotrexate. And do you know how to get rid of it? Okay. I have wonderful. So okay. people have read my paper, which is International Journal, has published it. Six cup of coffee in a particular schedule, and after three weeks, you will never have a patient who has any adverse effect of anticipatory time. So use that. Don't be scared. Remember, there is a threshold for absorption of methotrexate at the intestinal mucosa. 15 milligram, and Dr. Mehra beautifully mentioned it. Above 15 milligram single dose does not get absorbed. And if you divide the doses more than several days, then that doesn't work. So I have seen Monday, Wednesday, and Friday methotrexate. This is rubbish. Please don't do that. Never do that. If you have to split it 12 hours, as he already mentioned, these are some of the points take home. Methotrexate is the safest drug with my own hand 55 years. I have written and I have patient the other day at the clinic, one from 83, one from 85. Hey, who are you? Sir, I'm all right. I just brought somebody because my disease had disappeared, but I'm, I have not given up methotrexate. And they bring the patients and so 55 years, continuous methotrexate doesn't cause anything. Interstitial lung disease, I would like to mention, I have recorded it's on my Google Drive, anybody wants. Methotrexate prevents interstitial lung disease. Repeated trials and now American College of Rheumatology has ultimately in the latest guideline has mentioned in treatment, if there is early ILD, there is no contraindication for use of methotrexate. It will prevent further extension of interstitial <laughs> lung disease. And on the other hand, which probably it came so recently you Hello. might not have seen. Leptonomide causes interstitial lung disease. So be careful. And combining, as you Hello. mentioned, beautiful, combining leflonamide and methotrexate is more toxic than methotrexate alone <coughs> or leflonamide alone. Bone marrow toxicity <coughs> is the main problem and liver, of course, is a major issue. These are some of the points which I would like to mention. And even if you are giving biologicals, don't forget they don't work quite well unless at the background you have methotrexate. And beautiful two talks and I had to just supplement to what they said and appreciating that you continue the flag of AIMS flying high. Thank you. Yes, sir. Professor Sukumar Mukherjee, sir. Give the microphone, sir. What Mahalavya has said, what I like to say, methotrexate is an anchor drug. Now we have got three choices sulfasalazine, nephulamide, and tofa. My question is that, in presence of this, how do you select the candidate? for methotrexate and TOFA, or we should go methotrexate to biologics? Excellent question. 
Yeah. Actually, sir, I still would go with the uh, ethyl trixate uh, sulfur salazine hydroxychloroquine. And then, you know, I think if one is able to handle with the drugs which have been in use for a long time, but if the, if the individual is not responding to methotrexate, can't tolerate methotrexate. But I would, yeah, question is like upfront going to tofacetin himself. That I, I don't know because I haven't yet thought of it. switch actually one from the other. That is important because in practical value, methotrexate, salazapyrene, methotrexate, H sequence, methotrexate, lepolamide. And then, <coughs> TOFA has come. Sir. Mm -hmm. The TOFA 5MG, like say, twice a day, like you know, at, but the, if I would use it only when there is a failing regime, sir. If I am doing quite well with the, either methotrexate monotherapy or combination, uh, if I am attaining uh, good uh, disease control. It depends on the patient's response. How do you place 1, 2, 3 and TOFA? And probably, no sir, I think that at this point, though, sir, long term data is still lacking. Like, probably that's why we hesitate to, you know, switch. Uh, probably prefer methotrexate to lefronamide or to sulfasalazine instead of methotrexate to tofa directly. I think Professor Aldia uh, has a comment regarding like related to that. Professor Mukherjee, I will, I will like to answer. Uh, your question is wonderful. Methotrexate will be the start in group two, and there are patients <coughs> where despite coffee and despite all the things, they don't tolerate. And then you like to switch over. Or you get a partial response to methotrexate, and then the question that arises, which drug to add, um, add to the regime? Majority of the time, we often ask the patient, how much can you afford? Majority will say, we cannot afford the, the, the real things, biologicals. Even the, uh, the similars they are unable to afford. Bicitinib, unless you are you know, doing hair up here, you still get the original, although I know Indian bicitinib is available. So in such a case, we will definitely add sulfasalazine. And by the way, I never start methotrexate alone, and there is a reason. In the API textbook of medicine, the rheumatoid chapter is written by me. And I have given the reason why I have proposed against the ACR guideline and ULR guideline, methotrexate in India should be combined with hydroxychloroquine. The reason being, we are the epicenter of metabolic syndrome. And hydroxychloroquine has seven major other actions that include prevention against uh, diabetes, um, prevention against clot formation, reduce, reduction of the um, atherosclerotic um, lipid uh, profile, and many others. So I will suggest that Indians being the metabolic syndrome epicenter in the world, we start with methotrexate plus hydroxychloroquine in every patient. If this regime starts failing, then if the patient cannot afford, I will add leflonamide or sulfasalazine. Sulfasalazine to us, even now the Britishers have finally agreed. They always use sulfasalazine as first, but now they have written clearly that methotrexate is first. Sulfasalazine is not as good as methotrexate. So now we answer the question, methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, some problem, intolerance or not no uh, full response, never achieved low disease or, uh, or uh, complete remission, then do we add tofacitinib or a biological? That's when I will add tofacitinib with very careful family history of heart disease. There is no doubt in post-surveillance uh, phase 4 study, tofacitinib causes atherosclerotic thromboembolic disease. And therefore, you take, go up to grandfather, grandmother, uncles, aunts, and all, and if there is history or one or two heart attacks, avoid it. And this is the way we are treating. And I strongly recommend you people not, I have seen a few prescriptions, not from you, but I have seen prescriptions from general physicians. A rheumatoid possibility, RA factor, so-called positive, patient given tofacitinib. I think that is malpractice. That is malpractice. We need some phenotype of RA to go for the combination. 
Professor Mukherjee has I said to you agree. You are even it's coming. It's uh, coming. It's coming. Biologicals will again, tell you. Uh, we know time. You see, uh, mRNA studies on single cell is very soon coming, which will tell you from day one which patient of rheumatoid, yes. which yes. is the precision yes. medicine. Yes. Just uh, we might not. I may not be here, but they will be there to do that. But I must say this paper of baricitinib, the only second drug that can fully re replace methotrexate, which was very heartening. So occasionally if you come across a patient who just cannot take methotrexate, baricitinib is the drug of choice. Until today, it has not been proven that jacinibs, uh, the adverse effect on cardiovascular, is a class uh, specific. Uh, as specific. It looks like it is more for tofacitinib, Baricitinib till now, no heart attack problem. So if a patient cannot, I will use baricitinib. But if they can afford, I will go for TNF inhibitor as the first drug. Thank you, sir. In patients with chronic kidney diseases and rheumatoid arthritis, so uh, which uh, uh, which BMRD would you prefer, and how would you modify the doses? Methotrexate you can continue. Only thing you may have to lower the dose. You may have to do. Very clear, but ah, based upon each year. Uh, I am uh, Professor Shankar Dutta from uh, Indian Medical College, Kolkata, and Professor in Medical Department. I want to. Ha I have two questions. One is you told about gold. Is it available in India? And secondly, what about Tigura Timor? It had uh, some with the bank, but now it is rarely. Gold is available, but again it is you know like in Delhi. I, I, that time this patient I am talking uh, quite some time back. But he was, he was uh, able to get it to Nath Brothers in Delhi. Now it is available or not? I am not, you know, lately I have not used. But we have never used gold. Now it is not available. But uh, he was, I will still tell you that he had excellent response and he had, uh, he had cirrhosis. Uh, you know that, and he was doing very well on gold. Nothing else was helping him that much. He couldn't give him methotrexate and leflunomide, you know. So that, that was the only case I remember.